Call the meeting of the City Council Finance Committee to order for March 2nd, 2015. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Sullivan. If we could take a moment of silence, the City of Brockton lost uh, a great person. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Russell passed away, and you know Russell Peeker and David Russell and David Jr. And, and the Russells have been in this, uh, in this city, and they've been champions of this city for many, many years. So if we could take a moment of silence, uh, I'd appreciate that, and I know the Russells would. May she rest in peace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor. Councilors, you have the agenda before you, and as you know, we have a lot of items on this agenda this evening. Um, that I know it, at some point when we get to a couple of the items uh, where some guests may not be able to be here, we'll deal with that at that particular time. So with, um, with that being said, uh, the first few items are pretty simplified. Then we'll get to the item number five, which talks about the uh, special election. I will set the tone to that when we get to that particular number. But in any case, um, without any further interruptions, I'll ask the Madam Clerk to start with order number one, please. Order, appropriation $43,200 from Massachusetts Department of Public Health first responder Naloxone grant to Brockton, Brockton Police Department first responder Naloxone grant fund $22,230 and to Brockton Fire Department first responder Naloxone grant fund $20,880. These grants funds will be used to buy the life-saving opiate overdose nasal reversal kits. There is no grant match requirement. Invited, Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter. John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, John Crowley, Interim Police Chief, and Richard Francis, Fire Chief. Good evening, Mr. Condon. Uh, good evening, Councilors. Uh, this is a grant, uh, which is a single grant, but it's proposed to be split uh, according to the submission to the state, uh, part for the Fire Department and part, part for the Police Department. And I think both Chief Francis and uh, Captain Williamson are here to, to discuss the particulars. But the reason it's two numbers is that the grant itself was to be split between fire and police. Good. Thank you, Mr. Condon. Uh, Chief, Chief Francis, any uh, any comment? Uh, Interim uh, inter Chief Crowley. Anyone have any questions? Councils, any questions for these gentlemen? I do. <coughs> Council Dubois. Thank you so much. Good evening, Council. Hi, Chief. How do you come to uh, procure this this grant money? Um, <clears throat> This was a grant that um, became available from the state uh, due to the overwhelming number of uh, uh, <clears throat> opiate overdoses throughout the state, uh, where Brockton is, is uh, a city that has a, has a lot of overdoses from opiates. Uh, it was, a, it was um, <clears throat> opened up to us, and the police and fire department jointly together filed for the grant. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Chairman, make a favorable recommendation back to the full city council. council. Motion's been made and seconded to rec back, recommend favorably back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? It goes back to the full city council. Favorable recommendation. Yep. Item number two, Madam Clerk. Order. Appropriation $395,164 from Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, Fiscal Year 2015 Municipal Police Services Staffing Grant. Two, Brockton Police Department Fiscal Year 2015 Municipal Police Service Staffing Grant Fund. These grant funds provide overtime funds for the Brockton Police to use for community policing beats, community policing activities, patrol shift replacements, detective investigations, <coughs> ride-alongs, quality of life impact shifts, etc. There is no required match for these funds. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, John Crowley, Interim Police Chief. Uh, councilors, Council, uh, sorry, Mr. Condon. Uh, basically, this is a uh, a grant which is a periodic grant the state provides to the city of Brockton. In this particular year, it's been reduced by about a third, as the state is having uh, some budget difficulties. But nonetheless, it's almost four hundred thousand dollars to the city. Last year it was six hundred thousand. It's a it's a grant that does have a time limit for its expenditure beginning in uh, upon acceptance with about in the calendar year, and as you can see, it's used basically for direct police services, and there's no match on it. Uh, the specifics in terms of how the police department would use it, I think Captain Williamson could could address. Thank you, Mr. Condon. Uh, Councilor Bonds. Yes, uh, Captain Williamson. It says on here there's uh, the several things that this money will go to, but I just wanted to be clear. Will it also go to the motorcycle, bicycle, and walking beats as well? Uh, yes, it most likely will. Uh, walking beats, definitely. Okay. Uh, the motorcycle beats, we usually take those guys off patrol to do the motorcycle beats, and <clears throat> if it requires us to fill it with overtime, that's what we'll do. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Council. Councilor DiNapoli. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Captain. Hello. Will this take us to uh, the uh, end of the fiscal year? It, it, the money? Yeah, we won't need any money funding for overtime the way I understand it for the rest of the fiscal year. Uh, this money we will have until October. Oh, this money will be, oh, it'll last? We, we can use it until October. Until October. Or until we use it up. All right, very good. Thank, thank you, Captain. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Council. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Condon, or perhaps Captain, you said this has generally been about 600000 the last, yeah, last, last time. Last year was 608. Last year was 608000 um, Do you see a sharp cutback in services with this being $200,000 less? Or? Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't think. There will be some cutback. We'll, we'll just have to kind of watch ourselves a little bit. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Captain. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Councilor Sullivan. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Captain, I just had a quick question for you relative to uh, this appropriation, a little under 400 grand. I know when we talked about overtime relative to the police in the past and when Interim Chief Hayden was here at the time, um, we, we talked about code enforcement. I see one of the stipulations in the clause here is quality of life. Is this going to be a percentage used relative to code enforcement? Because I think uh, now's the time to do that. Uh, that's something that uh, Chief Crowley might be able to better answer. Uh, he couldn't make it tonight. Um, I do know that's an issue. There was an issue at the last, the last time when we were <clears throat> afforded that overtime. Uh, I don't really have a definitive answer on that. Okay. Well, I, I, know, I hope so. I appreciate that. I know what we'll do as a council is we're going to file a resolve to get an update, so it's on a separate matter, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank Council you, Mr. Dubois. Chairman. You're welcome, Council. Hi, Captain Williamson. Hello. Can you tell me how the city wound up getting awarded these funds? Was it an we'll application process? Who filled it out? Or is it a budgetary process? What happened here? Well, we do have a grant coordinator that yep. works on that, and um, she could probably answer that better than I can. It's something that she, she does. Uh, so you don't know if, it, if she applied for it or if it was I'm sure just she, a regular grant that they give out every year? Yes, yeah, she, uh, she does apply for it. We don't know whether we're going okay, to so get it or not. Apply. Okay. Um, we don't know how much. It yeah. depends on what the state has for money to offer. All right. And do you know, um, has code, the code enforcement officer been reinstated in the Brockton Police Department or is uh, Officer Allman still not on code enforcement? Officer Allman has been assigned to the day shift patrol. Is there an officer on code enforcement now? Uh, we do have a liaison to the health department, Sergeant Sleeman. What's the What's that mean, a liaison to the health department? Um, I'd have I'd have I'm not ex he still works the the day shift, but apparently he's been working with the health department. They contact him when they have an issue okay, so regarding we'll vehicles that need to be towed. So I guess we'll get more information when the other thing is filed on this, the code enforcement maybe with the other counselors. I'm not sure. All right. Well, I really would like to see code enforcement be a full-time responsibility of one or more police officers in the city and not just leave it up to the Board of Health. Um, that's just my two cents. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you. Motion to recommend favor. Again. Again. Uh, on the motion. Mr. Chair, if I could, the mayor is here and he's an invited guest. I want to, Mr. Mayor, if I could just follow up on Council du Rep State Representative Dubois' uh, question. Do, do you know, is there a code enforcement officer right now being utilized? Right. My understanding at this point is that there are code enforcement duties being shared by at least two or three officers. I'm not in a position to comment on a specific individual personnel matter, uh, but, you know, we certainly would be willing to make Chief Crowley available. Chief Crowley had a death in his family, had a funeral today, and that's why he's not here. He was planning to do If, if you, you recall, when, when Mr. Hayden was here, and, and it was through my colleague here, Mr. DiNapoli from Ward 5, the, the question was asked relative to the support. If we support, will there be code enforcement? And I believe Mr. Hayden, I know he's not here, but he said tomorrow there will be. Right. And that was about a month and a half ago, Mr. Mayor. Right. Council, I believe, I was here that night, I believe that the chief's commitment was to the function, not necessarily to a specific member of the force. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, the way it was phrased, that's correct. I, so I, I do know that Chief Hayden the next day did make some changes uh, to enlist code enforcement. 
Um, I don't run the police department on a day-to-day -day basis, nor do we comment publicly on personnel matters using individual names. So I'm, I'm know, not asking no, I, I, for that, I Mr. Mayor. I just want to know the city of 100,000 if there's a code enforcement. We have a larger commitment to code enforcement than we have in any time in recent history that I can recall. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Mayor. Any other questions on the motion? Motion's been made and seconded to refer back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed, it goes back to the full city council. Thank you. Item number three, Madam Clerk. Order, transfer $10,000 from Finance Department Personal Services other than overtime to Animal Control Personal Services Overtime in order to provide funding for the additional overtime costs necessary to maintain staff and during periods of unavoidable and unexpected personal absences. Be advised that there is a $10,000 is also available in the finance department budget due to a vacant budget <clears throat> position. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Tom Tachillis, Supervisor of Animal Control. Move for a favorable recommendation to the full city council. Second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded that this goes back to the full city council on the, on the motion. motion. <clears throat> Councilor DiNapoli. Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Connick. Is Mr. Tachillis here? Is Tom here? Yes, I, did, I have one question, Tom. How are you tonight? Um, you have a, uh, a position that is, is budgeted, a, an empty position, correct? Uh, no, we have all the uh, positions of filled. So right you're, you're, you're full? Full staff. I have one officer that is currently out on workman's comp. Okay, that, that was my question. You, have, you do have a full staff? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Councilor Dubois. <clears throat> thank you. Mr. Duchellis, did, did my constituents adopt the dog today, do you know? Uh, they came down. They picked up an adoption application. Uh, I think they'll be back with, and they'll be leaving with a new thank puppy. Thank you very much. You do a great <laughs> job. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any other questions? Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second motion be made and seconded to send back to the full City Council. All in favor? Opposed goes back to the full City Council. <clears throat> Item number four. Thank you, Council. Order that the DPW is authorized to issue one single family home sewer connection to the Barros Realty Group, LLC, 1035 Layden Street, Brockton, for the property located at <coughs> Castle ID 180-023, Plot 14. Favorable in the City Council, February 9, 2015, postponed, invited Lawrence Riley, DPW Commissioner. Mr. Um, Council Chairman. Dubois. Hi, Mr. Good Rowley. Evening. Thank you for being here. So the reason that you're back, because you had been here um, a few finance committees ago about this item, and they asked you if the sewer interceptor there could handle it, and you were like, yup. And we've had conversations since where you reiterated that you have new equipment that will make that issue that was um, brought to my attention by residents go away. So you had said that the interceptor was good, and then the next day I got calls from several residents on Wellsford Ave that said that um, often they deal with the smell of septic and raw sewerage um, on their street, and there's like a, a stream and a sewer interceptor, and I guess if you could explain what you explained to me as to why it gets clogged and how you're going to fix it and how this um, additional sewerage won't affect that problem just so the residents can hear it I would appreciate it Councilor. this is just normal maintenance that we have to perform in that area it's it's due to grease and whatever they're flushing down their toilets um, we're aware of it and it's more like preventive maintenance for us so we visit that site that's what the smell is every once in a while if the sewer lines start they start to back up um, most of the residents call us, we get there right away, and we use the jet rider and we jet it all out. So there's no problems there? My concern is only that, and I'm not an expert in this field by any means, but just when I witness it and the residents call me, so that area on Wellsford is a concern. And then um, maybe 200 feet down um, Hovenden off of the end of um, Oscar Ave, it backs up so bad there that you can actually see the human waste coming up. That hasn't happened for a couple summers now. But I'm wondering, like, are those two issues connected, would you think, on the same line because they're so close together? Is that something uh, that... I'm sure it is, Councillor, because once we free where we have that backup, what we're freeing, that's going downstream. And grease is like a big candle inside a pipe. Is there a long-term solution for this? Because it seems like... like 
I understand if it's just Greece, maybe there isn't. The long-term solution is somehow having this segment of the population that's pretty normal. I don't understand how they we, have this problem, but I don't. This is not the only area in the city that we experience this problem. It's all over. So we'll just keep it, it is due to Greece. All right. People are just <clears throat> putting Greece down their toilets, oh, down, their, down their sinks, and they shouldn't be because it creates such a problem inside that pipe. It just builds up. It's like, it's like, like I said, a big candle. What makes this area more vulnerable for this to happen opposed to other areas if everybody well, they pours must, they, grease there's down more the people drain. dumping grease. <laughs> this is very strange. More people dumping grease. We used to just have it with the restaurants, but now it's, it's, it's a lot of the homeowners. It's such a residential neighborhood. I would think that these pipes would be even less used than some of the more densely. Yeah, no, it's, 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 surprising, where, is... it's surprising where you have these problems. It, well, it is a significant concern for the neighbors in that area, and so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to make a favorable recommendation, but when can they cut into the, they can't even cut in for a sewer connection right now, right? No, they because, can't, not until April 1st. So this isn't holding anything up? No, it's them. not. Okay, no. great. So I'm going to move for a favorable recommendation, but I would love it if I could set up a meeting with you and the residents so you can make her feel more comfortable that this is just a maintenance issue and not something um, maybe more serious that we might be ignoring. That's fine. I would really Whenever appreciate you'd like that. To. Thank Whenever you. So you'd I'm like. going to move for a favorable recommendation. Motion has been made and seconded for a favorable recommendation. Back to the floor. On, on, on the motion. Motion, Councilor, please. Councilor Studinsky. Mr. Chairman, I, I noticed the address of this company. I mentioned it at our meeting. And I'm going to ask the commissioner. 1035 Layden Street is where the company claims their offices. Is that in Brockton? I, I, I'm not, I'm not I aware of I can tell you right now, Mr. Commissioner, that street's far too small to have a 1035 on it. Yeah. Through the chair to my fellow councilor. Councilor Dubois. I will um, call this um, purchaser and then speak with the auditor's department who sold them the land or the real estate, real estate, um, what is his name? Real estate commissioner or real estate? Custodian. Council. Custodian, Custodian, thank you for the help and see if this is the address that they gave to him or if this is some kind of just error in the text. Is that okay? And then come back next week and let you know? Certainly. Thank you. Fine with me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Motion to made and seconded that it goes back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full <coughs> city council with a favorable recommendation and we will check uh, on that address as well. Item number um, five, Madam Clerk. Order, in compliance with the provisions of the elections laws, notice is hereby given that the special election will be held on Tuesday, May 12, 2015. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Philip C. Nazarella, City Solicitor, John McGarry, Executive Director, Michael Conley, Attorney, Mintz, Levin, Cohen, Farris, Glovsky, and Papeo, PC Law Office, Neil Bloom, CEO of Rush Street Gaming, LLC, Mass Gaming Entertainment, LLC. Scott Struzner, <coughs> Mass Gaming Entertainment, LLC. Councilors, you have all information in front of you <coughs> pertaining to this particular um, uh, item. And just to bring to your attention, again, the ordinance, the, or, the order, excuse me, that is before you is based upon the election laws and, and it is speaking about having a special election on Tuesday, May 12, 2015. Questions have been asked about the host community agreement, which all of you should have received a copy of and have had a chance to take a look at. <clears throat> and I thank the mayor's office for making sure that that information got out in a timely fashion after I had my weekly meeting with him that we made sure that everybody did receive it so that you would have it in time for this evening's meeting. We have people present this evening um, from the Rush Street Gaming and from the Mass Gaming as, as well as our people, Mr. Condon, Mr. Uh, Attorney Nezzarella, um, that can answer some questions that we may have pertaining to this particular item. We're going to have a brief presentation, PowerPoint presentation as well, uh, just because I think it's only refreshing to all of us to understand just what <coughs> is before us. But again, I'm going to keep reminding people what is before you. It's to hold a special election on Tuesday, May the 12th for this particular item to go to the voters of the city of Brockton to ask them what their thought is in regards to us having this project here in the city of Brockton. That's what's before us. We will have some questioning per se 
towards the host agreement, but the host agreement is pretty much signed, sealed, delivered. It goes with the vote. If a council feels that they do not want to support the terms of the host community agreement, then you have every right, every right, to say that you do not want to have a special election. Again, attorneys will be here to work with us on this, but I just want to remind you that that's what we're dealing with here this evening, is that particular um, item, or, or, or the way the order is written. So um, I know Mr. Bloom is here, he's the CEO um, from Rush Street Gaming, and I know some other people here. I don't know, you mentioned a gentleman that was gonna start off to give us a quick presentation. If you just wanna say hello, and then we can go from there, it's, it's up to whatever you uh, wish to do. Mr. Carney, Mr. Carney is present here as well. Yes. I'll ask Mr. Carney to. Uh, no, obje no objections to Mr. Carney saying. Uh, I, want, I want to thank the uh, City Council for giving us an opportunity to come here tonight and explain what we're trying to do. I've been a lifelong citizen of Brockton for many years, and I've ran the Brockton Fair, my family, for the last 50 odd years. If this is not the easiest decision I'm making, to be very honest with you. But I thought this was an opportunity that would be great for the city of Brockton, where we'd have a class operation, one that would pay millions of dollars to the city in taxes that they desperately need, with the overhead and costs going up continually through no fault of anybody other than the, it goes along today with the cost of the police, the fire, the school teachers, and, and general maintenance. As far as the thing is concerned, and they all do a great job, and the city needs them all. The city is very well managed. The Condon that spoke before me, he enjoys a reputation of being a hard-nosed customer, and, and has done a great job watching the city's funds. Tonight, it, this is not an easy thing for me to do because of the fact, like I said, not to repeat myself, the fair has been part of my life. It's been a great thing, I think, for the city of Brockton. There's been hundreds and thousands of people in the past 50 years that didn't have the money to go to the beach in the summertime. We ran the Brockton Fair where they could come and watch fireworks. They had great entertainment at a very low cost. And it's been very, very successful, and it's very successful as I stand here tonight. But I think it's about time that we, this opportunity came along. And I've had more than one opportunity to be involved with gaming. And Neil Bloom, that I'm very happy to introduce here tonight, is runs a class act, and if he wasn't, I wouldn't be in front of you people, because I'm gonna stay here, I'm gonna live the rest of my life. Brockton's been good to the county family for a long, long time, and I'd like to introduce Neil Blom. He can, he can speak more about what he's gonna do, what the city is gonna do. I know that the city, if the people in the city of Brockton needs jobs, there's gonna be at least uh, 1,500 jobs with health insurance that won't be on the city or state's payroll or the tab of the city of the state. They uh, are jobs that are desperately needed. That, that's, one, that's one thing, plus there'd be many millions of dollars paid in taxes. It's uh, a situation that this opportunity probably will never come along again, and I think it's a great opportunity, and I hope that the city council will approve it, and I don't think they'll ever be sorry for it. I'm gonna tell, turn over to you, Neil Blom, a man from Chicago that has a great reputation, and uh, I think you do a great job for the city. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Carney. <clears throat> Good evening again, Mr. Bloom. Thank you for giving me a chance to uh, talk to you all tonight. And uh, I thank the chairman and the city council for this opportunity. And thanks for the introduction, George. Um, let me start out first by mentioning that uh, I have a part of our team here today. Uh, this is Scott Struzner, who's doing most of the work putting this transaction together. Further to the right is our uh, our uh, uh, attorney with uh, our general counsel with Rush Street, uh, uh, Paul Seaman. Uh, we have uh, our chief operating officer. Once this is built, uh, he will be in charge of running this thing, um, David Patton. And we have our chief financial officer, Tim Dracup, and his right-hand man who looks like he's right. He does all the work, uh, uh, Ryan Tennant. So uh, thank you. Uh, so let me start by uh, saying we're, we're here to tell you about this project, tell you about ourselves, and answer any questions you may have. 
Uh, first, let me give, tell you a little bit about who I am and who our company is. I grew up in Chicago. Um, uh, from a meager background, I was raised by a single mother and my sister. Uh, she was a bookkeeper, my mother. Uh, I went to the University of Illinois. I went to Northwestern Law School on a scholarship. And when I graduated, I went to work for a large law firm in Chicago, one of the largest. I worked there and uh, I became a young partner, but I always wanted to go into business. So in 1970, I left uh, to start a real estate company from scratch with my roommate from college. The uh, name of the company was JMB Realty. Uh, when I left, I had a $27,000 house, a $25,000 mortgage, and the difference minus my credit cards was my net worth. And we started with uh, three people in a tiny office, and we built that business up at JMB into one of the leading real estate companies in uh, North America. Um, we started small. The first thing we ever did was a little mobile home park uh, that cost $135,000. That wasn't the legal fees. That's what the whole place cost. And over the years, uh, we, as I said, built it up and uh, we're involved in uh, some of the major projects, real estate projects in the United States and internationally. And first and foremost, we are real estate investors and developers. Some of the projects that you may know about here in Boston, uh, we were involved in the development of Copley Place. We actually made an investment uh, while it was under construction, and then we ended up buying the company that was the developer that was Urban Shopping Centers, and we owned Copley Place for many years until we put it into a REIT that we took public uh, on the New York Stock Exchange, of which I was co-chairman of the board. Uh, we owned the entire project. Um, we developed the Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, in Chicago. Uh, we developed uh, uh, most of Century City in Los Angeles, uh, including MGM Tower. It's a picture of it. We developed 900 North Michigan Avenue, which is where our office is, which has a Bloomingdale shopping center and a Four Seasons Hotel, uh, condominiums, and an office where our office is. Um, and uh, a project that I'm sure you're familiar with and one of the first that I ever got involved in was Faneuil Hall. When the Rouse Company came up with the idea, couldn't get financing, we became a partner with them, put up most of the equity, and we're a 50-50 owner with the Rouse Company and uh, Faneuil Hall for many years. Um, we took our properties public. Um, our shopping centers in a company on the New York Stock Exchange called Urban Shopping Centers, which was a very successful REIT. Um, the, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the mid-90s, I started a private equity real estate firm called Walton Street Capital, which invests for major pension <laughs> funds and other institutions. Um, and uh, ultimately also got into the uh, gaming business, which is why I'm here today. All told, we have done over, uh, invested or developed in over $50 billion worth of really high class real estate. Many top Ritz Carlton hotels, Four Seasons, major office complexes, shopping malls, etc. So about 15 years ago, we were approached to get involved in, in uh, uh, an RFP to win the license to build a casino in Niagara Falls, Canada for the government of Ontario. Um, we had never done a casino before, so we said we got to bring in an operator because we had never operated a casino yet. Uh, we went and won an RFP and uh, ended up uh, winning the award from the government of Ontario, and we built a billion dollar project overlooking Niagara Falls in in, uh, in Canada, um, and uh, uh, that is operated today by our company. We got a, under Canadian law, we have to sell the project to the government, but they then uh, gave us a 25-year contract to run it, and we currently run it. I'm chairman of the board of the company that runs that property. After we completed that project, uh, one of my partners, Greg Carlin, uh, and I decided that we would uh, get into the development of casinos here in the United States. And uh, uh, since then, 
uh, we have been the leading developer of regional casinos in major metropolitan areas in the United States since the Great Recession. Uh, the projects that we've done, we started with the Sugar House Casino in Philadelphia, which is the only casino in the city of Philadelphia. They awarded two licenses. Uh, the other license uh, that was awarded, both of them just before the recession in 2007, uh, they never could get the financing done, and the gaming board revoked their license. Uh, we finished our project. It was probably the first project built since the recession, and it's the only casino in Philadelphia. And we're currently uh, underway on a, an expansion for about $160 million. Um, we also built a project, the only casino in Pittsburgh. Uh, that project was awarded to another developer. Again, the, rece the re Great Recession hit. Uh, the developer uh, ran out of money. The contractors <coughs> were working off the job. Uh, there were, the state was concerned it might go into bankruptcy. We got a call to get involved. We had already been licensed in Pennsylvania. So we took over the project, put up fresh equity, built that project, uh, and it's uh, been voted the nicest casino uh, uh, in Pennsylvania. You'll hear more about that from David Patton. Uh, we also developed uh, the, uh, a project in Chicago, actually in Des Plaines, a suburb right near O'Hare Airport called the Rivers Casino. Uh, that project uh, is considered one of the finest, if not the finest, regional casino in the United States. We generate the highest win per gaming position of any casino in North America. And in that project, uh, we have a partner, uh, which is ClearVest, who are here today, who are also going to be partnering with us uh, in this project. Uh, if you uh, decide to have a referendum and we win the referendum and get selected by the gaming board, uh, we're confident that if we are selected uh, in a, in a uh, referendum, that we will, uh, we will win uh, because of our site, our experience, and track record. Um, and uh, ClearVest, as I said, will be partnering with us in this uh, project. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to turn this over uh, for a few minutes uh, to uh, my partner, uh, David Patton, who's our chief operating officer, who will give you much more information about uh, all of our projects. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Bloom. Thank you. David. Thank you, Neil. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the City Council. Thank you very much for having us here tonight. Give you just a couple minutes on, on my background. I've been with Neil now for a little over five years. Uh, grew up in Montana, but actually was educated uh, here in Massachusetts. I spent seven years in college and in law school up in Cambridge. Uh, was indoctrinated as a Red Sox and Patriots fan at the time. Those are the two teams that weren't winning, but I guess that worked out okay. Uh, like Neil, I was an attorney. Uh, who left the practice to uh, pursue a business career. I worked for the largest, what was at the time the largest gaming company, uh, for about seven years before ultimately leaving and coming to work for Neil and Rust Street Gaming just around the time that we were opening the Pittsburgh property. Um, you can see on the screen, I know it's, it's, it's hard to read, but the, the properties that Neil took you through are featured on this slide. Uh, just to give you an example of the scale of the business, the thing that I think we're most proud of, if you look at the third column, is the number of jobs that we've created. Uh, we currently have over 4,300 uh, team members that work for us uh, in properties that have been opened uh, over the past four years or so. Uh, and for the latest project that we are currently planning in Schenectady, uh, we estimate another 1,200 team members will be, uh, will be added uh, to the family at, at, at that property. Uh, Neil took you through uh, the casinos that we operate. Here's just some pictures to give you uh, an idea of what they look like. Uh, Rivers and Displains, as Neil mentioned, that's the number one casino in Illinois. We do more than double the revenue of our nearest competitor. Uh, the Sugar House in Philadelphia, which has been open for a little more than four years and is uh, undergoing a significant expansion right now to, to literally double the size of the casino and add a lot of non-gaming amenities to it. Uh, the Rivers Casino in Pittsburgh, which is the largest casino that we've got operating in the United States. And then our new uh, project in Schenectady, the Rivers Casino and Resort at Mohawk Harbor. Uh, now that was, uh, we won a, a very competitive RFP process uh, for the right to build that casino. And in that process, we built, beat uh, both the uh, Hard Rock and uh, Churchill Downs folks that were competing against us. And then there's a 
picture of the beautiful resort in, in Ontario that we, uh, Rush Street does not manage uh, that facility, but that was built uh, by Neil uh, and his team back in 2004. All of the properties that we operate win important awards from the team members that work for us and from the people that are in a position to judge the quality of casino projects. So if you look at the kinds of awards we win, all of our properties have won best place to work awards. And in many cases, they've won them virtually every year that they've been in operation. Uh, Sugar House has won every year for a best place to work and a top 20 workplace in Philadelphia by the two publications uh, that give those awards. Rivers in Pittsburgh has been named as the best overall casino resort in the state of Pennsylvania for all five years and best overall casino for three out of four years by the other major publication that covers that. Rivers and Displains has been named a best place to work uh, every year it's been in operation and also best casino in Illinois uh, for three years running. And the Fallsview Casino also has won many important awards. And that's really a result of the great management teams and the team members that work at those casinos who do it every day. We're very proud of the fact that we provide great jobs for our team members. Uh, as I mentioned, all of our casinos have been voted best place to work in 2014 and for multiple years in many cases. One of the reasons that they are voted like that is because of the wages, benefits um, that we provide. You know, the median salary that our non-management team members make, so these are people who are not supervisors, they're not managers, they're not directors, this is the line <coughs> team members is $50,000, including benefits. So we provide really good jobs that provide good wages for our team members. And at the same time, we provide a lot of career development, training, education, tuition reimbursement programs so that they can have careers and not just jobs. We're also very big on promoting people from within. Uh, I know the slide there says 1,900. That number is actually over 2,000. We've had more than 2,000 people uh, promoted since our properties have opened and well over 400 of those coming in the last year. We have a very diverse workforce. Our workforces really reflect the diversity of the <coughs> cities in which we operate. You can see what the numbers look like. Um, we're I draw your attention to the, uh, the line at the bottom, vice presidents and up. So these are the senior executives that really manage these properties. Half of our vice presidents uh, and up are female and almost 40% uh, our minority. So we, we have very, um, very strong, very diverse workforces. I like this slide because it shows uh, green. Uh, people outside where the sun is shining and it's warm. Uh, so we can look forward to that hopefully in the next month or two. Um, these are just some, some pictures of farmers markets and, and uh, other uh, community uh, events that we have run at our, at our various properties. Our team members are extremely active in the community. We donate literally tens of thousands of hours every year. <coughs> Uh, to soup kitchens, food banks, uh, they paint houses, they build houses. Um, our team has been very, very committed in all of our communities to do that, and it would be no different here uh, in Brockton. It's really hard to overemphasize the importance of jobs and also providing opportunities for the, for the unemployed. And if there's anything we've learned in the five years that we've been operating, it's how important it is to have outreach programs to the community job training organizations. In Philadelphia, when we opened, uh, we had a lot of outreach that we did uh, to, to people who did not have work currently. And 35% of the people that came to work for us when we opened in Philadelphia were unemployed at that time. And I imagine that we will be partnering with a lot of organizations here. This is a very small list. Um, it's literally dozens and dozens of uh, community and job training organizations that we've partnered with uh, in the jurisdictions in the cities that we operate. Our facility in Brockton will be LEED Certified Gold. We've done it before. We're, in fact, we were the first LEED Certified Gold Casino in the world when we opened Rivers Displains in 2011. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to building on that reputation and, and building a, a beautiful facility here that will be uh, energy efficient and also LEED Certified. Now, in addition to the direct jobs that our casinos provide and the tax revenues to our local jurisdictions, our casinos have actually been engines for development in the immediate neighborhoods that we operate. In Philadelphia, the Fishtown neighborhood, which literally has houses across the street from the casino, um, that has become one of, the, one of the hottest residential areas in Philadelphia, and average housing rents have increased over 40% uh, in that neighborhood since we opened. In Pittsburgh, 
We've had a tremendous amount of development since we opened in 2009, uh, including new hotels, corporate headquarters. Uh, a light rail has come uh, to the North Shore of Pittsburgh that wasn't there before. Uh, there's a performance center, and uh, a number of small businesses have sprouted up on that area as well. And the story in Displains is, is similar. There's been significant mixed use uh, developments, new entertainment park. Um, there's an outlet mall that opened in 2013. It's been really great to see how bringing our projects to areas can help spur a development that goes far beyond the direct jobs that we uh, provide at the casinos. Being a good neighbor is extremely important to us. You know, we partner with local law enforcement um, in every place that we operate. And anybody who's interested in understanding what happens with regard to crime should just, you know, call the police chiefs, call the local law enforcement in the cities they operate, and, and they will tell you that we are a great neighbor and that crime is not an issue. Here are some uh, quotes from folks uh, in Pittsburgh, Des Plaines, and Philadelphia to that effect. Um, no adverse effects from our casino, virtually no crime. Uh, and, the, and in fact, in Philadelphia, there was a fairly significant study that they undertook, uh, and they actually found a reduction in burglary offenses and, and in drug crime. And one of the reasons for that is, you know, <coughs> you think about it, casinos have hundreds and hundreds of cameras, both inside the facility and outside the facility. Um, it's really safer than going to a shopping mall. The last place you want to commit a crime probably is, is at the casino, because we're going we're gonna to see what's happening. And what we've seen is that, in fact, uh, We've been a good neighbor, and, and, and crime has never, has never been an issue in any of the places that we operate. So I want to turn our attention now from the Rush Street story and talk about this, this project in particular. Just to orient everybody, this map shows the three regions uh, as carved up by the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. We uh, in Brockton here are in Region C, which is the southeast region. The next slide shows you a flyover of the site, which is highlighted in yellow. Uh, and when we met with Mr. Carney and were able to look over the site, we really felt this was a, a terrific site uh, for a casino resort. Uh, the access to the area is very good, although uh, we will be commissioning a study to understand uh, what the traffic impacts will be and other impacts and, and making all the necessary improvements to make sure that, uh, that access uh, is as good as it can be and that any additional traffic gets handled. Uh, it's on 45 acres, which provides a very good amount of land for the project allows us to build um, a full-scale resort. So we couldn't be happier with the site and what it's gonna, uh, the opportunities that it's gonna offer. Here's a brief rundown of the actual project. Uh, again, it's not, a casino, it's not just a casino. It's, a, it's really a full-scale uh, resort as well. Obviously, we'll have a large gaming floor with very diverse offer offerings, but we'll have a lot of different restaurants, many different price points across a wide range of cuisine. Uh, that will serve not just our gaming customers, but people who just want to stop in for a bite um, will be, uh, we think, very uh, enticing for them. Uh, we're going to have a large multifunction event and entertainment space for meetings, weddings, group functions, you name it. We've got uh, such a space in Pittsburgh that's only about 10,000 square feet, so this will be even bigger. And we've been able to um, run a lot of, of different events. It's booked almost every day of the year. We imagine that uh, that will be a similar story here. Uh, we're also going to have a, um, a hotel, very nice hotel, full service, with a spa, health club, and pool. And uh, we also believe that, um, that this project will not uh, just appeal to uh, the folks who, who live in the, in the immediate area, but it should spur uh, a good amount of tourism as well, which will, um, which will benefit businesses all around of us. In terms of employment, we think it's going to be a great opportunity for folks who live in Brockton. Uh, there will be a hiring preference for construction and permanent jobs. We will hold, it says hold career and job fair. My guess is we'll probably hold multiple uh, fairs to reach out to the citizens. We've done, done this in every other place that we've opened. We've had our job fairs attended by well over 100,000 people in total in the three cities that we've opened casinos in the last few years. It's been uh, hugely successful, and, and I imagine it'll be just as successful here. We also spend a lot of time and effort uh, and resources uh, toward training. Uh, a lot of people probably will not have worked in gaming before, and we understand that. And so, you know, if somebody wants to be a, a dealer, uh, we have a dealer school. And uh, we train them how, how to do that. We pay for that. Uh, the applicants don't have to pay for that. So that is uh, another, we think, significant benefit as well, the training that we'll provide our, our team members. Um, we estimate at least uh, 1,400 permanent <coughs> construction, or 1,400 construction jobs and 1,500 permanent uh, direct jobs once the project is open. 
One thing we've seen in, in each city that we've operated is that local business actually uh, benefits from working with us, and, and here's why. Um, number one, our team members, they like to go out. So when they come to the casino, they don't necessarily want to eat at the casino, so they will go to local restaurants to eat. They will um, patronize uh, local merchants, and now that they've got jobs and they've got money in their pocket, they're looking for a place to spend them, and they naturally want to spend them um, here in the local community. Uh, we will, we buy a lot of things. We buy millions and millions of dollars of things, uh, food, beverage, uh, supplies, et cetera. And whenever possible, we like to utilize uh, local suppliers, local contractors, uh, particularly in our restaurants, whenever, again, whenever that's possible. Uh, in order to help make sure that vendors know uh, what's required in order to do business with the casino, we educate them. Because when you're working in a regulated industry like gaming, in many cases you have to get a gaming license. And so that's a process. And there are certain requirements you have to go through. We can take them through those requirements. We hold vendor fairs, educate them uh, to make things easier for them. Uh, we've committed to spend at least $50,000 a year uh, to purchase gift cards uh, to be redeemed at Brockton businesses as part of our, part of our um, loyalty program. And, uh, and we're going to launch what we call Rush Rewards Plus, which is a program whereby our customers can go to local merchants and, and redeem uh, points that they've earned at the local businesses. And we've had uh, success with that when we've done that in Philadelphia. We think uh, local merchants will be very receptive to that here. This time I'm going to turn it back to Neil to take you through the financial benefits to the city of Brockton. Thanks, David. <clears throat> in addition to the, all the jobs we're going to create, which I think is really critically important, there were, and all of the ancillary economic benefits, there will be direct uh, cash benefits to the city. And I'd like to take you through a review of that. Um, there will be a $3 million community enhancement fee which is paid in three installment when we start construction. Then each year there's an annual payment which will be equal, which will go to the city, which will be equal to the greater of $10 million a year or two and a quarter percent of our gaming revenues each year. 80% of that or a minimum of $8 million would be as a pilot program for real estate and personal property taxes. 15% or a million and a half minimum, it would be a community impact fee, and 5% uh, a contribution to the Brockton Community Foundation. There will be hotel and meal, and, uh, meal taxes and whatever taxes would normally be generated by the hotel. Uh, we will pay for an impact studies to assess the project's impact on the city's traffic, utilities, public safety, and the city generally, including schools and housing. And uh, we will uh, provide uh, the agreed upon mitigations uh, that will be necessary. In addition, there's a further benefit um, that goes to the city. Under the state law, all right, uh, Ten percent of the license fee, our license fee to the state is $85 million. Ten percent of that uh, is taken by the state and put into a separate fund from each casino. And then each host community and the surrounding affected uh, communities can apply to get that money paid to, this, to the uh, host community and the surrounding communities. In addition, every year, Six and a half percent of the taxes that are paid to the gaming taxes that are paid to the state uh, go into a similar kind of fund. We estimate that this project will do uh, around $400 million worth of gaming revenue. So that means that the state taxes each year would be $100 million. So the six and a half percent would be another six and a half million every year will be placed into this fund and the uh, host communities and surrounding communities can take that money out of the fund. And assuming you get your fair share, which is the amount of money that was put in from, from our casino, uh, you would get uh, um, eight and a half million dollars potentially up front uh, out of the license fee. And uh, uh, assuming we do 400 million of revenue, 
approximately uh, uh, six and a half million dollars uh, a year. Um, so the bottom line of this is we think this is a winning situation for everybody. But first, uh, let me say that we have a terrific team to do this, and I'm really honored to be doing this with uh, George Carney and his family. I should tell you that uh, we were introduced by a, a, a bank who said that George was thinking about whether to do, maybe do a casino here. <clears throat> and I flew down and met George. We hit it off very well. Uh, we both like to work. <laughs> and uh, we hit it off well. We shook hands, and uh, we haven't had a disagreement since. And uh, uh, they will sell us the land, uh, but they will also invest in the, in the project, and they will be uh, a minority partner in the project along with us and uh, uh, ClearVest. This project is going to cost approximately $650 million. Uh, that's soup to nuts. That's the land, the license fee, the construction costs, et cetera, interest, uh, soft costs, et cetera. Uh, you've heard about the meaningful and ongoing economic boost to, this, to the area and the city. Our experience in all of our other casinos has been very, very positive. You, it'll create all these jobs for the city. These are good jobs. They're a chance for people to uh, improve their lives, and uh, that's very important to us. It'll generate revenue uh, for the local community, as I've outlined. Uh, it'll bring in more people from all over the state and some tourism. Uh, and our experience has been in the long run, uh, this creates a lot of benefits, uh, in tangible and tangible, to the city. And you can call any of the other cities or mayors that we've done these with. And they've all been very, very happy. And we will build a project that we will be proud of. Uh, and I think uh, we, I wouldn't do this. Uh, I don't need to do this project. I've been very lucky in my life. Uh, but uh, we wouldn't do something that we'd be embarrassed or not proud of, and we would build a very nice project, and I think uh, it'll be a great boost for the city. So uh, with that, uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, any of you may have. Uh, that's why we're here. So thank you for this opportunity to tell you about the project. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Neil. We appreciate that. Appreciate, appreciate the uh, presentation. And also, David, we appreciate uh, all that you had to uh, say and, and contribute in regards to the project uh, as well. As uh, I said, counselors, uh, we will take some, some questions. I'm sure some people have some concerns, but I'm going to always drive you back to what the order is in front of us. It's to call for a special election to be held on Tuesday, May the 12th, 2015. Keep in mind, there is a time frame here. That's why they are here this evening, because this time frame is of essence for the election to be held on May 12th. And if we say yes to it, then they have to hit the ground running and they have to go out campaigning. It's almost like something we're going to be doing in the next few months, campaigning. And that's what this is all about. You've got to get out there and they've got to hit, they've got to hit it hard. So again, counselors, um, just keep in mind. Uh, I'm going to start, Councilor Cruz, because you did sign on to bring this. Thank you. Here. Yes, I did file. I just want to thank you for your presentation, Mr. Bloom. And uh, somewhat what you did tonight is really for the people, the public at home, because uh, uh, some of us have seen some of the presentation. But also, as our chairman said, we actually have one question in front of us tonight. And in fact, before I get into asking you some questions, uh, could I register of voters, Mr. McGarry? I believe he's here. Just wanted to ask our registrar some questions. The, the, the order before us is, is basically for us to vote to put this on the ballot. Um, what's the time frame that you need if we weren't to finish this tonight and mon next Monday? What do you need for a time frame for this to be on by May 12th? Council, I, I will need uh, the question, the actual question by April 7th. That's, by April that's 7th. the drop dead deadline to have this election on May 12th. And even though, and I'm asking you this more to let the people at home know, what's it cost us to run a citywide election? This is the, uh, the, the estimate I came up with for my office, and you have to remember that the police department also has to uh, provide police officers, and historically their costs are between thirty-five and $45,000 <clears> per election, depending on who works the election. 
and uh, my costs are approximately $71,000. And under the state uh, law governing this, though, the applicant pays for that, correct? They reimburse the city. They have 30 days in, in time to reimburse the city for the costs. Thank you. So, so the applicant pays for it. They, they reimburse us, but they pay for it, the election. It, but again, with the time frame you have uh, before you, I will have to get an order before you through the mayor's office requesting funding to, to uh, pay for this election, and then um, the city will be, it would be reimbursed for it. If the voters don't vote for it, they're still on the hook for the money, though, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you on that. Um, that, I believe, is, uh, is all I have for you. Although, being a former counselor, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I, while, I'm, while I have the floor, my former uh, predecessor is here tonight, Co Councilor Paula. I know what I see in the back of the room. Uh, there he is. He's probably on the phone. But uh, thank you for your information. I wanted the people at home to understand that this election, that the city is not on the hook for the cost of this election. Correct, Councilor. The, uh, the uh, election is paid for by the applicant. Uh, uh, thank you. And again, I think I'll open this up to other people, but uh, I just want to talk to my colleagues. This is, th the presentation was wonderful, and my guess is that you will be around the city at many, many places making this present, if it passes tonight and Monday night, making this presentation to a lot of people in the city of Brockton, I have to say I think this is one of the best opportunities the city of Brockton has had to bring in uh, extensive financial uh, wherewithal that we haven't had for a long time and uh, an exciting project too. Not without some issues that, and as the Ward 1 counselor and the Ward 3 counselor, Mr. Ianeri and Mr. Monaghan from Ward 2, we will have to work with you on traffic mitigation in particular, but we'll do those studies and we'll work with you, And in my opinion. but. To us, to my colleagues, this is basically a no-brainer. All we are asked to do under the state law is to, to allow this to go to the ballot for a binding referendum. What the voters say goes. So I would ask uh, all of my colleagues, uh, after they have their questions answered, to uh, vote yes on this tonight and Monday night, because this is strictly to give the people in the city an opportunity to speak and make their decision on this. Not, this is not a non-binding referendum. This is a decision that the voters get to make. And again, I think this is too big a deal not to uh, give them the opportunity to, to, to voice their opinion. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Bloom, and I'll turn it over. Thank you, uh, Councilor. Councilor Moynihan. Yes, uh, Mr. Bloom, please. Good evening. How are you? Thanks for the nice presentation. I will say that uh, <clears throat> I was in Chicago a couple of years ago and um, for a union conference, and um, we took a gamble, and I let my wife loose in one of your um, <laughs> 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 Bloomingdale's, and uh, believe me, I paid for it. But hopefully, if they open a casino, we'll be able to get some back. But anyway, and I concur with Councilor Cruz. Uh, this really, I think, is a good opportunity for the city. As our um, wards uh, surround. Uh, the board of, board of the fairgrounds. I've had a few calls already, and on the Thurber Ave side <clears throat> of the uh, fairgrounds, uh, the neighbors are concerned, and basically, as far as where the building will be placed, do you know already, do you have an idea of where will it be placed on the, where the business side is on the Belmont Street, yes, Forest Ave side, where like Shaw's is and what have you, is that where your main building will be near the, near the uh, grandstands and what have you? because they're really concerned about noise and, and uh, traffic on that far side. I'm going to ask uh, uh, my associate, Scott, to take you through that. We're still planning it, but uh, we're very cognizant of all of the issues. So why don't you give them an idea of what we're planning here? Hello, my name, Hello, my name is Scott Striessner. I work for the Bloom Family Office. Thank you for allowing us to appear here be be before you tonight. Um, to reiterate what just Neil said, um, we're cognizant of your constituents and the, ho and, and the housing that borders this site. We're going to be sensitive to those issues and try to reach out and get feedback. Um, it's a little premature uh, at this meeting tonight to explain the site plan. It's, it's uh, being designed cur 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 currently. Right. Um, but we are sensitive to, to those issues and certainly we'll, we'll We'll, we'll, we'll keep them in mind. Okay, because I've, you are going to be having public meetings, I think, uh, with the, the constituents, or well, the citizens, explaining more, you know, answering their questions or what have you. And I think that's, if they want to vote for this, especially in my ward, in that area, I think that's a big concern, and they want to uh, make sure that they're going to be comfortable with it being there and uh, not be disturbed. 
Cer certainly, we, we understand that, we anticipate it, and, and we certainly look forward to and planning engaging in, 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 in those, con in, in those con conversations. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bloom. Thank you, thank you Councillor. Councillor Barnes. Uh, yes, I'm actually not sure who would answer this question. It might be uh, Mr. McGarry. When drafting the question, who does that? How does that happen? What kind of language will be used? Is there a certain kind of, well, this is several questions. Is there a certain uh, state mandated language that needs to be used? And Council is under um, Mass, CM, Mass 205 CMR, Massachusetts Gaming Commission, section. Is it 23K? Is it 124.05, it gives you the, the wording that is required. And then you also have to have a synopsis, and then it's a yes or no question. Okay. But there is a format that has to be followed, and it's in the, and so the, the city's attorney would, um, you know, help, would draw it up um, and get the question properly before us. But again, the, the uh, deadline to have that is April 7th. Because we have to, uh, there is a time frame that has to be followed to, to meet the May 12th election date. Okay. Okay. And uh, just one more, if I may, Mr. President. The amenities that you, that are in the presentation here with the hotel and all of those things, probably um, you with the, the uh, information on the development, would people need to be members of this hotel or the casino or anything? I have like, like in, um, Foxwoods, they have those cards that people have and you get points and you do all these other kinds of things. I know you said that you'll uh, give the $50,000 to area businesses so people can cash them in, but would you require that for folks or can somebody just walk off the street and maybe have dinner, a buffet or something? Now, everything should be open to the public. The, the loyalty program is something that's totally voluntary that people can join okay. and, and they're not at all required to do that. Staying in the hotel, anybody could stay in the hotel or use any facility in the, in the casino. Okay, um, and just one more thing. In these pictures, and I know that they're probably pretty representative of the, the already the casinos that you have now. How close in proximity are these particular fixtures to neighborhoods, schools, other commercial businesses? How close are they, and, and how how would ours kind of match up? Right. So it's it's actually very different in each um, city. Ryan, if you want to pull up uh, displays. So Desplaines is actually about a half a mile from, uh, there's a high school that's about a half a mile away. We're mainly, however, in a uh, commercial uh, district. There's not a lot of residential around. Um, there's a hotel to the north, some commercial developments, some restaurants uh, to the south of us. To the uh, very east, right across the street, is a forest preserve. Uh, so that's, that's where Desplaines sits. In, in Philadelphia, uh, Sugar House is on the banks of the Delaware River, so you've got the river on the uh, east side of us, and then on the west side of us uh, is the Fishtown neighborhood. So there's the casino, there's a street, and then right across from there uh, are some commercial buildings as well as residential uh, houses, a, a, a lot of them. And then to the north and south are some uh, commercial uh, areas. There's some uh, Dave and Buster's, and, and uh, there's a, a condominium. Actually, there's a condominium development uh, right adjacent to, to the property, so you have residents living there as well. And then in Pittsburgh, we're on the North Shore, which is really a mix. We're uh, right next to the Carnegie uh, Science Center, which is a family-friendly uh, science place <laughs> that uh, uh, we have a very good relationship with. They actually lease uh, parking spaces to, to us when we're uh, in an overflow situation. Heinz Field, where the um, Pittsburgh Steelers play, mm -hmm. ooh, uh, is, is uh, right there. And then PNC Park, where the Pittsburgh Pirates play, is uh, right next to that as well. And then there's, uh, there's an entertainment place. There's a bunch of restaurants, some, um, some mid-size hotels as well. So it's mainly in a, in a commercial area. But we've, we've had experience with both residential, some schools, and as well as commercial mixed-use areas around all of our casinos. So ours would be the most dense, densely located area, pretty much, of the ones you've done so far, right? Uh, you know, I, if, you, if, you, if you were to go to Philadelphia, you'd see, I think it's actually very, very similar in terms of the um, uh, amount of folks that are living in a residential area that are right by the casino. It's very, very similar, I think. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Stewart. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so very excited about the project. Overall, uh, conceptually, I support gaming in Massachusetts and have been on the record um, sort of defending the law that was passed in, in the last referendum so it would not be uh, repealed, and, and it wasn't, fortunately, though I think gaming is sort of mixed in terms of its benefits uh, and lack thereof to communities. Um, so it's, to me, this is a bit of a strange process not, not specifically for this project, um, but for how the process works. So we're often asked to vote on agreements that have already been written. And in this case, um, we're asked to sort of <coughs> agree with the document and therefore support having the, the referendum. So I have um, some questions about, about what I'm reading here and so that I can understand um, what it's saying and have confidence uh, in the document uh, to gain my vote here. And this is not in any particular order, um, but my notes are sort of throughout the document. I'm not certain who the right person is, so I'll ask the question and then you guys can decide. Um, so in terms of promotion, so it goes, it goes uh, to the ballot and then there's a period where folks are advocating in support of this project. So I'm assuming that um, your company would be um, um, laying out some kind of marketing campaign to persuade voters to support the project. Is that correct? I'm not certain who's the right person. Hello, it's, my name is Scott Tristan again. Um, we probably will in, engage in some sort of community outreach about this project, yes. And do you know how it's typically, do you, uh, do you have a sense of the cost of that campaign or? I, I, I really don't. I mean, uh, project is different and in Massachusetts uh, they have a more structured process than at least the other in, um, project that I was in, involved with so I, I really don't have a is that information that you can provide to us before next Monday's meeting so we vote today to send it back to the full council where the final vote happens I'd like to have a sense of what that campaign looks like before then I don't think we'll have that in for for next Monday. E e okay, can you tell me what you've done in other cities in terms of what the cost, what you spent before? Gosh, I'm. Yeah, I, th I think it's <coughs> yeah. A referendum, right. but I can tell you, uh, some of you may know this, but before we decided to move forward on this project, we did do a sample polling, hmm. and uh, we had a favorable result uh, in that. Uh, from our polling. Um, so this is so this is the only state you've worked in where it required a referendum to go through. Yeah, Massachusetts, Massachusetts is, is is different that way. I can't speak to Pennsylvania, but I know in in, in Illinois, it was really up to the city. You know, the, the the city decided to support the project, and then as soon as the city decided to support the project, it was up to the gaming commission to select a winner. Uh, Massachusetts uh, is, is the only just that, I, that I've participated in where it goes to a formal public ballot. So I when, I, when, I, when I struggle to answer your question, mm -hmm. it's really because it's a little unprecedented, at least with respect to my experience. I see. And so we're going into what could possibly very, could be very soon, um, a referendum on a project that's over $600 million. And I'm assuming you're working through what those numbers look like to put this campaign together. I mean, because it's... I mean, we are. We are, but the point, yes, but, um, and so yes, we will, like I said, engage in community outreach and try to educate the community on the project um, and, you know, listen to their feedback, et cetera, and engage in that sort of, con those sorts of conversations, um, but it's just difficult right here or even within the next week to try to give you an estimate of, of a budget at that time, at okay. this time. Okay, I appreciate that. And then who offers the counter voice? So for those individuals who may be concerned about this project and are interested in it, in it not prevailing, uh, what's, what's the norm for um, uh, an information campaign in opposition to this? So. Can I speak on that, please? Can I speak on yeah, that question? Okay. Uh, Councilor, first of all, just to, just to kind of clarify it, the Massachusetts elected it to do it this way here. As far as the thing is concerned, it's the only state that I know of in the country that's going in this direction. As far as the thing is, as far as it's concerned, so as far as what what we're going to spend for the campaign, we haven't really decided yet. I know that the last election in November, 
75 percent of the people living in Brockton voted not to do away with slots at the casinos or at Plainridge, where they have just a slot parlor. So Brockton overwhelmingly supported the gaming bill. I think if you want to take the time, check it up. I think it was 75 percent in favor. As far as our budget is concerned, we haven't decided yet that we're standing here tonight because we didn't want to make any commitments to a company that would be doing that till we found out how we, you know, how we fared tonight. So as far as the thing is concerned, uh, right now, uh, and I'm speaking because I understand this neighborhood a lot better than these fellows are from Chicago, and I understand that uh, probably we will be for days figuring out just how much we're going to spend. We're not going to spend any more than we have to, to be honest with you. <laughs> I have, I have a question for the city. Sure, go ahead. Let's Thank you, Mr. Carney. I have a question for Mr. Um, city Solicitor, or maybe it's the mayor. So who offers the counter voice publicly uh, for residents? So if, if voters are to be informed uh, in a balanced way, what, what is typically the process for uh, the other side having its opinion expressed? I understand that the... Um the applicant will be conducting local meetings uh, through their city council, through the city councilors, ward meetings, um, public forums by which the public can come and issue their concerns, their questions, their interest. So I th if that answers the question, I know they, they, that's part of their campaign to conduct a citywide uh, program whereby they're informing the public as well as receiving input from the public. I see, but in terms of advocacy, there's no, I, and I'm asking this question because I'm just not certain. So uh, in terms of advocacy, there's no um, counter voice that balances the fact that the, uh, the proponents are looking to have this voted favorably. Other than through the respected council. I see. Okay, I appreciate that. And I'm, and I'm not looking for a particular answer, I'm just trying to understand this process. Um, well, the, 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 but I, I would like to please respond to that quest point. In every one of these referendums, or even when there aren't referendums, there are a certain percentage of the population, not the majority, but a minority, all right, who is intrinsically opposed to gaming, okay, and others who will have other concerns, and they will raise those issues, and they get raised, and in the end, either the city council or the mayor, however each town uh, deals with it, has to make a decision. In the case of, of your state, okay, you decided to have a, re once you approve the host community agreement and want to move forward, it's up to the public in a referendum to make that decision. And in the end, the people will vote and a decision will be made. Uh, in some cases, they were voted down. In many other cases, they were voted favorably. Um, and frankly, uh, the places that typically have voted for it are cities that could use the economic development, the tax revenue, the jobs, and, uh, and deal with the, the real world uh, where there are need for employment, jobs, et cetera. And that's one of the reasons that we selected, besides the fact this is a good site, we selected your city because we thought that they would likely a vote to approve this because of the economic benefits, jobs, and everything else. But there will be opposition, and we will have to answer that opposition and explain things, and we would do that at public meeting or forum that we would have, et cetera. Okay. So I do think this will be well aired, and in the end, the public will decide what they want. Right. Well, thank you, Mr. Bloom. And I do appreciate your, your coming today, and I uh, obviously research your work and it's very exciting to have uh, the potential of this project here. Uh, Mr. Carney, so I'm, I'm trying to understand the footprint here. So there's no longer a Brockton fairground uh, and... Um, well, it was there when I left. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what happens to things like the Brockton Fair and I'm just trying to, so what happens, what happens moving forward? I'm, I'm sorry. Right. So some of the traditions of the city, so the Brockton Fair, and I mean, what, what, I'm just trying to understand what happens moving forward with those. Well, what's going to happen there is basically is the following. And I'll be very frank and honest with you. 
if this falls on uh, deaf ears and we're not successful in getting it through, it'll be probably to be developed. Because at my, at my age, at 86, most people don't even buy green bananas. And I'm looking, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking to, you know, work till I'm well, probably 95, so. <laughs> anyway, but I think this would be a great opportunity for the city. I know that, I know from the past, and I know how the jobs are and how scarce they are, because we hire everybody we can. Sometimes we hire more than we need. But we don't like to send anybody home hungry. And I mean that seriously. You can ask the people that we hire. We have a great reputation. I'm not making a habit of short changing people as far as I think is concerned. I think this would be an outstanding opportunity. I have been here more or less all my life. I haven't seen anybody come along to bring anything to Brockton in the last 50 years but trouble. It's a great opportunity to get people to work. Maybe you have a job. There's a lot of people I know, counselors, that don't have a job. I know one thing. We have a great, I have a great reputation with the minorities. Minorities need the work. My, my people were minority 100 years ago, 50 years ago. I know how it is because I'm Irish myself. I'm very proud of it. This is a great opportunity to help people that need help. So my question, I guess my question is, so in terms of, I just want to make certain I'm understanding. Well, I'll and, answer and, your and questions. I'll be very no, yeah, happy. Sir. And I, I just want to also make, make it clear that residents understand what, this, what the impact will be. So essentially there's no fairgrounds if this deal goes through and it, if it's voted in, in favor and that, uh, and I'm, not saying, I'm not making a judgment. I just want to make oh, no, certain that no. people understand. Well, <clears throat> um, well, there's a good possibility that that's not going to be there if it doesn't go through because I'm going to look okay. to develop it. As far as I think it's concerned, and I don't know of anything I can develop, to be frank with you, that's going to bring that kind of money into the city of Brockton. I, it'll be developed, I'll guarantee you that, because like I said, I think it's a time to move on, mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned, and uh, I know one thing, that it will not bring, you know, like the fellow says, it will not bring what I'm bringing here tonight. And I'm not down here with my hand, you know, looking to, to beg for anything. I'm here doing something for the city of Brockton. The city of Brockton has been good for the counties for the last 50 odd years I've been here. And I think there's a great opportunity. There will, there will be difference of opinion. Nobody ever agrees on everything. That's, like, that's why politics is what it is. But I just tell you this, I make this very clear. There's an opportunity for Brockton. Uh, there's nothing I'm going to do to bring into Brockton Fair that's going to equal this opportunity here. There won't be 15, uh, 1,500 jobs, and there won't be better than $10, $10 million a year in taxes, because mm -hmm. there's nobody else that's coming along to bring something like this, as far as the thing is concerned. I'm so happy to find a man that's got that kind of a background that I'm proud to be associated with, got a great reputation, and will do a good job. I'm not, I'd like to leave something that Brockton would always remember. And that's how I feel, and I thank everybody for their time, and you can vote however your conscience guides you. Thank you. Actually, I have, I'm sorry, I have, I have a few more questions, <coughs> Mr. Carney. I have, I, I did. Um, <laughs> so, and I'm, I'm not really... I the talk in case you <laughs> can get it out. The, um, and again, I'm leaning in favor of the project, but I do need to understand what's in this document, because this is what we're being, we're being asked to vote on. Um, and I don't have a lot of experience with how the fairgrounds has been operating. I know there's been lots of talk of people wanting it to be a tax generator, which is what this is turning into. So I mean, there's a board of directors, correct, for the fairgrounds. Yes. And clearly then, because this transition is happening, the board of directors has yes. voted in favor of this. Uh, help me understand who's on the board. And I'm assuming there's a minority, <coughs> well, I'm very, majority. I'm very, I'm very proud to say this. My daughter, Jill, is here tonight with me. She is the president and treasurer. I got Debbie Richardson that's sitting here with my wife, that's the secretary and also a director. I got Bob Kelly, my son-in-law, that's also a director, as far as anything is concerned. And no one doesn't get paid. <laughs> and that's the fact. As far as the thing is concerned, the, uh, Brockton, we pay state taxes, we pay federal taxes, we're not required to. And we pay taxes into the city of Brockton, we're not required to by law. And I brought the former head assessor down here, Bernie Siegel, if there was any questions about taxes or what the city does, I'd be very happy to explain it. I just happened to bring something myself. As far as the thing is concerned, Brockton. Sure. 
But like I say, I just happen to have this I can't so in case that. this question came up. Yeah. Now in 19, the year 2013, the different companies that I own paid $632,000 in taxes. This year here in 2014, we paid $705,000 in taxes. Along with water bills in 2013, we paid $39,000. I'm reading the small parts, just the big parts. In, last, in 2014, we paid $45,000. So I'm not looking up here for a handout. I figure the counties have carried their load pretty well in the city of Brockton. This is how it is. And I brought this along just in case there was an issue, because somebody mentioned about the, ta the fair doesn't pay tax. We pay taxes everywhere. We, the fair doesn't have to pay. We pay corporation taxes, and we pay state taxes. Any other questions anybody uh, else would have? Uh, I have other questions, but I have questions for the city solicitor. Uh, what, Betty? Uh, I'm, I'm okay with you. Oh, okay. Well, thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Council, I, I, I just do want to remind you of what's before you. I understand, That's what, Mr. President. What we're, okay. And, and a lot of the questions you're asking for, you're not going to have an answer until you have a yes or a no. Unfortunately, it, it's not something in writing. So let's just keep moving along. Go ahead, uh, attorney. Mr. Solicitor, so in the agreement, I don't, and I'm assuming you have it in front of you. So 2.1, no, um, it talks about the, um, th that you know, certain contractors will be hired in terms of the development of the project. Um, so I'm assuming that most of those decisions are made by the developer who the contractors are with, with this agreement that they'll spec Brockton con uh, businesses and individuals that first. That's correct. They as the developers will choose who the contractors will be, but they have also made a parallel commitment that most of the um, labor contract for services will be within Brockton companies if available. Okay. They will be given priority um, uh, priority uh, sign to go forward and engage with the city of Brockton or w with this particular contract. Okay. Uh, my other. <laughs> and also, it'll be a hundred percent union job. The teamsters, the electricians, the uh, everybody that's in the unions will all be given the jobs. As far as I think it's concerned, we do not run. We run a 100% union company. There's met several of them coming here tonight because they know their interests. I have the, the Teamsters Union here. I got the Electricians Union here. I got the Steel Workers Union here and many other unions here because they got a lot at stake and they're here tonight because they need the work. Because this is also cited close to a school, and also in the agreement it talks about um, you know, big and close collaboration with the fire chief and the police chief around the studies, impact studies, um, because of the proximity to the high school, I'm assuming the school department will be a key collaborator in looking at mitigation impacts on student travel and impacts of gaming on, on young people. They will be, and we've already had communication with the school superintendent. She will be part and parcel of this. And closely informed and that will be uh, part with the impact study as to the best way so that uh, no one is infringing on any of the current city services, traffic, et cetera. Okay, uh, and then also listed, it talked about um, looking at how the city could better use uh, the Shaw Center and, and it, it was not explicitly mentioned in the agreement uh, concerning the stadium itself and sort of thinking through uses of the stadium, was that purposely neglected? For no, bo both issues have been uh, talked about at length uh, as far as the uh, Shaw Center in the stadium and part of the mitigation factor as well and how we can best accommodate fulfilling those services and using those properties so they are part and parcel with a part of the growing, uh, thriving economic boom that we uh, foresee with this project. So it would have some parallel growth with it. And, and that is uh, the, the mayor made certain that that was to be addressed so it wouldn't be left by the side, but part of the growing and, and flourishing aspect of this whole overall enterprise. Great. Um, it looks like payments to the city are coming in, in three forms, um, but one entity is the Brockton Community Foundation, uh, which struck me as being highlighted uh, as a private entity outside of a municipality that's receiving funding. So I had questions about um, who's on the board of this foundation. Right. That I cannot respond to. I don't know the answer to that. What is, is the mayor available to answer that question? Yeah. That's the Community Foundation. 
Can anyone answer that question? Uh, I don't believe there's anyone here from the city that would the, uh, know the membership of the board. Well, we have, so we have in this agreement a large sum of money going to a private foundation, and I'd like to know who's on the board of that foundation, how that foundation was named, and so it makes me a little concerned that we're not certain who's on that board. Yeah, I, I do not have that information this evening. I'll be happy to obtain it and provide it to you. Do you know why that foundation was named in this agreement? I do not know. Is there, is there, can we figure that out as well and have Absolutely. that presented to us? Absolutely. Uh, Rob May, okay. Uh, hello, Mr. May. Good evening. Uh, for the record, I'm Rob May. I'm Director of uh, Planning and Economic Development for the City of Brockton. Uh, the Brockton Community uh, Foundation is a yet-to-be-developed uh, foundation. I think that that's something that um, we, as a municipal government, are going to have to figure out the uh, um, representation on that board, but it's, it's a way to engage in community development projects across the city and not just look at um, uh, the direct impacts of the fairgrounds will be addressed, but this is a way to spread some of that wealth around. And so we felt that creating this foundation would be a way of addressing that those issues where community groups, community organizations uh, might be able to come forward and, and request funds for park improvements or, or sponsoring social events, um, marketing of, of particular business districts. So it, it, again, it's, it's a yet to be determined um, uh, mechanism, but it will be a, a municipal uh, controlled. So it's a private foundation. We're envisioning that it'll be in municipal control. Yes. And how does that work? I don't think I've ever seen a, um, a private well, we, foundation run by a city before. The city can create uh, boards and, and um, foundations um, by uh, city ordinance. Okay, I'm not familiar with it, but okay, I will kind of read up on that. Okay. Um, Anything else, Councilor? Uh, I may. One more, one more moment here. Uh, my, my last question for um, the city solicitor, just in terms of the framing of this agreement. So I realize that some of it is from, from a template of how this is organized and other cities have uh, agreements similar. I'm curious as to who is, who is driving the sort of the development of the content here. Uh, so were, was the city in the lead in terms of drafting this agreement or were the developers? Um, well, it was a collaborative effort, but we had uh, engaged a legal counsel that has a, a substantial amount of experience with these particular contracts and these particular developments, uh, Mintz and Levin, and uh, representatives of that law firm are here this evening if there's any specific questions about the uh, drafting of the contract. They scrutinized the contract line by line. They worked in collaboration with uh, the applicant in forming the final agreement. Okay, and my, my last question, uh, in section nine, one of the reasons why I'm initially supportive of the agreement is because of the firm that's making this proposal. So I was had the opportunity to you know, look at the work of the firm. But Section 9 says that this project can be uh, assigned to a different entity and that that sort of reassignment of the project can happen. It seems like at any moment without any... Um, accountability to the city or the voters. Am I reading that correctly? Well, as a general principle, most entities can be assigned. However, if they are assigned, the successor has to comply to the strict letter of the law with all of the terms within the main agreement. So there would be, uh, no matter who an assignee would be, they would still have to comply and act as though the initial entity without any change. Okay. All right. uh, thank you, Mr. Yeah. City Solicitor. Um, those are my questions. Thank you very much, Mr. President. You're all set, Counselor. Thank you. I'm sorry. Can, can, sure. Just if, one of the if you don't mind, can I just address your last question also? Please. That you know, all transfers, um, to my knowledge, um, in this jurisdiction as well as most other, if not all other jurisdictions, are subject to gaming commission approval. So the gaming commission is certainly going to make sure that whoever you know, if, if and when a transfer ever did take place, that's not 
in the foreseeable future. But if and when a transfer ever did take place, that you know the transferee was a credible company with financial wherewithal, okay. passes background checks, it, 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 et cetera. So you do have an oversight entity, albeit not the city, looking out for the best interest to make sure that that you know that that whoever is the transferee is a, a credible you know part 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 par, party. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Council, Council Stewart, just just a point uh, back to uh, the information you're asking in regards to, uh, you know, the information getting out there to the public, just so that you know, um, between Council of Ward One and Council of Ward Two, and I as the Council of Ward Three, we'll be the first to host the um, actual first informational meeting because it comes within our parameters to to our wards there. The fairgrounds does, so we would be ones that would be going out to, uh, you know, to to bring people together so that these people could come and also talk about it. So that's, that's the starter of how we uh, think if, if everything goes right uh, this evening and uh, we'd be the first ones out of the gate to have that information tonight. Um, Councillor uh, DiNapoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just a point of interest, uh, the audio is not going across on the feed outside. So you can only hear us, people watching on TV, it's all, they can't hear us. So we can say whatever we want. First of all, <laughs> First of all, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Carney? Yes, sir. How are you, George? Couldn't be any my, 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 my buddy. Yeah. Uh, and, and God bless you, George. My father just celebrated his 99th birthday. So well, I'm gonna, Chris, I'm, that's a goal for me 80, to try to strive to. 86, and he's still going strong. Uh, George, there are three regions that the uh, Massachusetts uh, Gaming Commission has given licenses, correct? Yes, sir. That's and, right, sir. And we're in C. That's right. Sir. So you got you got Springfield and you got Everett and you got we hope we Brockton. Brockton. How many other players are are in the running for that license? Right now, there, there's two others. Well, there's three of us in the running, but I think there'll be two of those uh, applicants will be gone on March 16th. I think we'll be the sole applicant after the 16th of March. That's in my opinion. Okay, because okay. uh, you know we're giving this out to the voters. And I just can't believe that other communities turned revenue and jobs away. And uh, we, we need revenue and we need jobs and we need money for the city of Brockton. And uh, George, I'm, I'm gonna support this venue because I believe in you and I believe in this. Thank you very much, right? I appreciate it. Okay. Hello, and believe me, I won't let you down. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna thank Mr. Bloom, I wanna thank Mr. Carney, I wanna thank uh, Rush Street, for those that aren't aware, these gentlemen flew in two weeks ago to the city of, city of Brockton to meet with all the elected officials, local and state. They met with public safety personnel. Uh, they met with school personnel. We met at the Shaw Center on two different days. We were cognizant of the open meeting law, so there was never too many councils there at once. Uh, a lot of the tough questions were asked at that time, but this is a simple question before us councilors. We meet in this room every Monday night as a legislative body. And we only sit up here because the voters decided to put us up here by voting us in. So the only thing we're doing tonight is to decide if the voters can abide by the democratic process. Put it on the ballot and let them decide. Much like when we put our names on the ballot, they either vote us in or vote us out. That's what we're here tonight to do. It's a simple question. I think we'd be doing a terrible disservice to the Brockton residents by not putting this forward. We need to put this forward. And then in May, you know, these gentlemen, this is their expertise. They can either, uh, you know, win the vote or not win the vote. But as 11 members of the council, we have to put this forward, in my humble opinion. You can talk about money. You can talk, <laughs> you talk about the union jobs, and this is great. We never have turnouts like this except for budget day. So thank you for coming down here tonight. <laughs> but, but this is uh, a promising endeavor for the city of Brockton, the city of champions. But again, it's for not unless the voters decide. So the question before us tonight is, are we gonna let the voters decide? I say yes, we need to do that, and I'm gonna make a motion to favorably recommend this back to the full city council. On Second. The, on the motion. Motion's been made and seconded to go back to the full city council on the motion, Council Dubois. Thank you so much. Um, may I please ask a couple questions of um, attorney Michael Connolly? Thank you so much. Thank you for coming and thank you everyone else for being here. This is a really great showing. So um, I just don't know the answer to this question. I assume that you do. Can a municipality operate a foundation? 
I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so what happens to the agreement if we find out that a municipality can't? Would that 5% um, as a contribution to the Brockton Community Foundation, would that revert to a different entity or would it go away? You know, I think the intent, and Mr. May described you pretty well, the intent is to set up an organization to benefit the city of Brockton, the residents of Brockton. Whether it's a private foundation, whether it's an arm of city council will be determined later. This was so, negotiated as to be an entity to bless and to help the city and the city residents. So it could be transferred to say like the, um, what is it called, the South Shore Community Foundation, which is similar to the Boston Foundation. So it wouldn't go away. The no. Five percent would not go away. The intent of the agreement is not, to, it is not to go away. Great. And then um, I've gotten, I've, I have some questions. Um, I've just been informed there's already a Brockton Educational Foundation. I'm sure great. there are other foundations, Wonderful. but it's not going away. Okay, that's great. And then um, why not have a vote on the host committee agreement since it's a binding contract and then have a vote on the um, date for the special, special election? I was interested in that because it's such an issue in a type B form of government where the city council has a fiduciary responsibility and a responsibility that we swear to when we get sworn in to make sure that we uphold the laws that are in the ordinance and in the charter. And there's such questions on when a municipality is entering into a contract, the city council should um, vote in support of it. So I've had conversations with the city council's attorney, and I, he has his opinion as to why they are combined. And I spoke with the attorney for the gaming commission, and the attorney for the gaming commission said if they are divided or they are voted together as one is based on the city city's charter and the city's form of government. I'd like to hear what your answer to my question is about why not vote on the host committee agreement since it's a binding multiple year, more than three year contract, and then the vote. Why are we choosing to do it together? Simply, the, the Gaming Act, the gaming statute, essentially says that the vote for this council is for the vote for the referendum for the election. Now, taking a step back, the intent of the Gaming Act was that it would go to the voters. And, and from my, my understanding, it's one of the only structures like this in the entire country. So the idea is that you vote to send it for a referendum to the voters, and then the voters vote on it. I guess what I'm talking about is why the council, in a normal fashion, without this legislation, which I read the legislation, and I didn't see anywhere where it specifically says the vote on the host committee and the vote on the election date are a combined effort. I didn't see it, but you are, you know, in the weeds on this, so maybe you have some knowledge that I don't, because in the normal course of things, if there wasn't a um, gaming legislation out there, um, this agreement, since it's more than three years and has more than something like 300, more than three years would come to the city council for approval and then we'd be able to vote on um, approving the agreement or not approving the agreement and maybe have more content on the different types of elements of the agreement one being um, the fact that this agreement is not tied to the consumer price index which is kind of important to me so um, I guess once we get the answer to my first question about why these votes aren't divided my next question is why, what was your thinking not to fight to get the payments tied to the consumer price price index. So I don't know how you guys want to answer that. Well, I, I'd just like to comment on one uh, statement, Councillor. I think there was a slight misstatement of the law. Uh, as far as being over three years does not mean it comes to Council for any type of approval. I think what you were referring to is from the Uniform Procurement Act, where if they're talking about purchase of supplies or services, then that would fall under that particular uh, act. I don't believe this particular application is applicable. But it's a, so it's a host committee agreement. Host committee, is it, agreement is the last one, right? Host committee. I don't, I do not believe. What is this called? What is the document? talks about the contracts, talks about other documents or other services, not this particular. But in section 2-157 of the Brockton City Ordinances, execution of legal instruments generally, it says that the mayor is author authorized to execute them, blah, 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 and all deeds, agreements, blah, 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 
and entered into by the City Council. So an order has to be entered into by the City Council. So are you saying that this order tonight um, fulfills this City Council ordinance? Or are you saying that state law um, supersedes the City Council ordinance because the gaming law somehow has more control? I mean, I'm just trying to get to, I'm not uh, opposed to it. I just want to understand saying, it. Uh, my statement is that if there is a if there is a difference between the state law and the local ordinance, the state law will supersede and trump the ordinance. Yeah, yeah I understand that. But so are you saying that the state law gives governance Counselor. on that? Counsel, let, let Attorney Gilday hop in on this, please. Counsel, with respect to the ordinance that you were citing, which is section 2-157, it says, except as otherwise provided, the mayor is authorized to execute and deliver in behalf of the city, all deeds and leases of land sold or leased by the city, and all deeds, agreements, indentures, and assurances made and entered into by order of the city council. Yeah. So this is not a deed for real estate. But it's an agreement. It's, but it's not an agreement entered into. But there's a into, common comma after all deeds. If I could finish. Yeah. It's not an agreement entered into by order of the city council. The council that is before the order that is before the council is to call for an election. The matter comes before the city council as a result of the Gaming Act, which Attorney Conley referenced, and the Gaming Act specifies that approval is ultimately by the voters of the city. Well, I understand what you're saying, but I don't think that you're answering my question because when you with the ordin the ordinance that you just read, it says all D's comma all agreements comma and goes on to a list so it isn't that the agreements all have to be related to a deed a deed comma is a separate element so all deeds have to um, if if there's an order of the council agreement so this is an agreement so I'm, I, I mean maybe I'm not following it like you're explaining it but I didn't see anywhere in the gaming law where it said that the host community agreement wasn't um, an independent vote of and linked it specifically to the special election vote. And then when I did speak with the Gaming Commission's attorney, she said it's up to your charter. So I, I mean, and your ordinances. So then I'm, so you're saying that you read this, or, this, this ordinance in a way that somehow circumvents the need for us to vote on it? Or are you saying that the Gaming Commission law says that it's unnecessary. I'm just trying to figure out what is the reason that these aren't, this agreement that's a contract for multiple years doesn't come before the city council for a vote. I did just one more time try to explain it and then maybe I'll, I'll move on. That's a long question. Yeah. Um, however, the section that you're referring to talks about deeds and instruments and when you reference agreements, the law and the ordinances of the city do not require every agreement to come before the city council. There is a provision of the Uniform Procurement Act that requires certain contracts that are longer than three or five years to come before the city council for approval. This is not one of those contracts. This is an agreement that is entered into pursuant to the Mass Gaming Act. And again, the Mass Gaming Act says approval comes from the voters. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna move on. Thank you so much. So what about the traffic? I just, no, 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 CPI, Consumer Price Index. Did you, when you were doing your negotiations, did you talk about that at all? Sure we did. Um, you should know that these negotiations were intense. They took a lot of time. They took a lot of time from the city resources. They took a lot of time from the mayor's office. They took a lot of time from my office. I'm with a real estate partner in my office and a government relations lawyer in my office that worked feverishly over several weeks to kind of pull this all together. In all negotiations, there's give and take. And ultimately, with the consumer price index increases, what we ended up with, and Mr. Bloom um, described it articulately, was a $10 million a year minimum with the upside if they do greater than the 2.5% of the gross gaming revenues. Um, you should know, and I'm not, I'm, I cannot, and I'm not going to get into the negotiations because, it's, as I said, it was too long and there was too much back and forth. The initial numbers, I can tell you, some of you might be surprised, were a lot lower. Ultimately, we negotiated what we thought was the best deal for the city of Crockton, which was a sizable, a material amount of money, 
and with the upside. So we did not, we gave up on the consumer price index increase because we have a guaranteed minimum payment plus the upside that if this casino does as well as the other casinos have done for Rush Street Gaming, we feel it's, a, it's good for the city. So on that, on the sheet, it says, um, assumes no tribal casino. So annual payments equal to or greater of 10 million or 2.5% of gaming revenues annually. What happens if, there, if the tribal casino opens in Taunton? How does this financial number change? The minimum drops down to, I believe, 6.5 million, and then you still have the upside based on the gross gaming revenue. Did the 2.25%? Six point seven five million. I, no, I, I missed the seven. Um, but so no, that was also negotiated because there is a feeling that if indeed there is an Indian casino in say Taunton or one of those places that could materially impact this casino, there'd have to be an adjustment. And again, that was negotiated heavily. So ten million or two point two five, whichever is greater? Yes. And then if there is a um, tribal casino, it goes to 6.75 million or 2.5%, whatever is greater? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> um, 2.25. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think I think I'm I'm done with questions for you, attorney. Thank you so much for your help. Oh, one more. When did you start the negotiations? When did you When did you first have your first meeting with negotiations? Because you said you've been working on it feverishly. So I believe that the first contact would have been around January 30th, if not afterwards. We probably became engaged in early February, and. I would say that since we became engaged in early February, I don't have the exact dates in front of me, it was um, a busy and intense negotiation. And one that I think at the end of the day, um, we all feel good about. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Attorney Nazarella, uh, could I just ask you a quick question? Could you please give me, and I think my fellow counselor, since you're sending it to me, a breakdown via email before next week on uh, the attorney costs for Mintz Levin in the negotiation process? Yes. Thank you very much. And then um, I think my next question is for one of the casino developers or Mr. Carney. I, I think one important point, uh, perhaps the council and the residents would like to know, those legal fees will be paid by Rush. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. That's great. That's really wonderful. Um, and then... Anything else, Counselor? Because there's a motion on the floor. I do. I have, I, have, uh, I have one more question, I believe. And it's about two more questions, actually. And I think it should go to one of the gaming um, developers or Mr. Carney. My first question is about the traffic on Belmont Street. So, so that's like a what is it that like a four lane road I think at first I, I believe one of the attorneys I wrote down what he wrote he said or the first presenters it says if any additional traffic comes it will get handled so I think that we can assume if we if you open up a 650 million dollar casino that we're going to have additional traffic or we're developing a losing proposition. So there's I, going I, to be I hope so. traffic, right? We want a lot of traffic. We want a lot of people coming in. That's the goal. But I drive on that Belmont Street from the highway down to the fairgrounds, and there have been several times where it's so congested that someone crosses the yellow line, and I feel like I'm, I'm dead right now. So like, what is the possibility for, have you thought about expanding? Is there any plan to make it a three-lane highway on each side, four-lane highway? My understanding is that they're working on, on doing everything they can to design it to make it as fast, because it's to our best interest that mm -hmm. the traffic moves along. Mm -hmm. And like I say, uh, Belmont Street compared to the Southeast Expressway is not bad. It's even a little better than 24, so it act we're going to watch that very carefully. We're going to do everything we can to improve it. We're going to have people that understand that far better than I do, but it will be something that will be addressed because we want people to be able to get there right. and get away. We don't want them to you know, feel it takes a long time to get there. I think that's one of the advantages we might have over the casino that's in Everett. 
Yep. You know, would they don't have to go through Sullivan Square if they come to Brockton. Right, right, I agree. That's important, I agree. Can I, can I ask sure. you questions if you may? Thank you. Okay. Right. First, as far as traffic is concerned, we are on the same page as you are. If we don't have good access and a good traffic into our property, and you pointed it out yourself, then uh, we're going to have a losing proposition. So we've got to make sure that the traffic conditions are right. We have a traffic consultants. We study all of this, and we and we do what we have to do to have acceptable traffic conditions. This is something important that you must recognize. When you have a casino, it's not like having a football right, game right. that at one o'clock on Sunday, sixty thousand people all show up. People come all the time. They come during the day, they come at night, come on weekends. It is true that the majority of the uh, were most crowded on Friday night, uh, Saturday, and weekends and Sundays, okay? That happens to be the time when you have less commercial traffic because we do more business on the weekend than we do during the week. So you get a steady flow. It doesn't all come at once, but we study the traffic and uh, we do mitigation as necessary. And there are studies and work being done to improve the traffic conditions even without us. Uh, so in your, in your opinion, just seeing the, you know, the 50,000 view, and I think you're more in depth than I am, but I know the area, do you foresee some improvements to Belmont Street if this casino gets approved? Or do you foresee it staying just the same way in just like your estimation, in your normal course of developing it. casinos? Do you, is part of it usually an investment in, in traffic? Or are there some that you never have to do anything with the streets outside the casino? Excuse me. Usually excuse there is excuse me. I just want to interject if I might uh, to the council because Belmont Street has already had a study done through the Old Colony Planning Council and with the state. And just to bring you up to speed, um, again, Belmont Street, which takes in Ward 1, takes in Ward 2, takes in Ward 3, and I've been working very feverishly in regards to that area because of the traffic flow and the problems that we have there. It's my understanding that these people are going to come forth and even work closer with the Old Colony Planning Council and with the state to help us get done what we need to have done in that whole area. That's Belmont Street, Forest Avenue, West Street, parts of West Street, that whole area is going to be all transitioned differently because it needs to be. It's not like we're waiting for this to happen, we're already working on it, but they're going to be a, a big part of helping us get it done even faster. Thank so you. So that's very what much. this whole project is all about, and that's what the project's going to do for us. Mr. May, did you want to jump Mr. in? Mr. President, for the folks at home, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more. Um, the, the casino proponent will be uh, hiring a, a transportation uh, consultant. They have done so actually, um, and I've already um, had phone conversations with them. They will be preparing a uh, traffic study and mitigation plan that will be reviewed um, in-house here. We will also be bringing on peer review, so we'll be bringing on an additional uh, consulting firm on their dime uh, to review that. Those, all that material, though, is also then reviewed by the Old Colony Planning Council and is part of a MEPA permitting process. So it will be eventually reviewed by the Secretary of um, Environmental and um, Energy Affairs, or Energy and Environmental Affairs, excuse me. Thank, thank you very you, thank much. You, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. All Chairman. All set, uh, Council? I am. Thank okay, you. Okay, there is a motion on the floor, and it has been seconded. Mr. President, on the, on the motion, I'd like to call for a uh, roll call. Vote, I was please. going to do that, Council, yes. And that's to send this um, order back to the full City Council. I'm going to ask for the clerk to, um, to call the roll. Shirley Azak. Yes. Shana Bonds. Yes. Timothy Cruz. Yes. Dennis DiNapoli. Yes. Michelle Dubois. Yes. Dennis Neri. Yes. Tom Monahan. Yes. Moises Rodriguez. Yes. Jess Stewart. Yes. Paul Stadinsky. Yes. Robert Sullivan. Yes. All yeas. Mr. Goes, Chairman. Goes back with a favorable recommendation. Council Chairman, Sullivan. I want to make a motion reconsideration in hopes it does not prevail. Second. 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 Motion was made and seconded for reconsideration in hopes it does not prevail. All in favor of reconsideration. All opposed? Reconsideration fails. That goes back to the full city council for action next Monday evening. We're going to take a five minute recess.
Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, councillors. Please come back into order. We still have some other items, and I, I do want to publicly thank all those who were present here this evening for that last item that we had, especially um, Mr. Bloom and, and uh, those from the Mass Gaming Association as well. Mr. Chairman. Um, could someone shut that door for me, please? Mr. Chairman. Council. While we're getting that closed, I'd be remiss after mentioning uh, other city councilors, past city councilors that were here, that we have State Representative Claire Cronin from our di the district thank here you, tonight State to try to get information. Thank you. So, Appreciate thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Take a bow. All right, we've, we're we back in session to item number seven. Six. Six, I'm sorry. Order, the city of Brockton shall accept the $339,000 40R Smart Growth Incentive divided from Gosh, piece of gum. Okay. dividend from the Commonwealth of in Reinvestment in and Planning Activities. Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Robert May, Director of Planning Department. Good evening, Mr. May. Good evening, Mr. President. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Is this yours? It's nice there's room in here now. <laughs> um, it seems like it was just six months ago, actually it was just six months ago, that I was here before um, this august body uh, talking about uh, a new position here and, and uh, being confirmed as uh, Director of Planning and Economic Development, no, just and wondering. one of the uh, several of the tasks that we talked about that we needed to do was a comprehensive plan, some additional downtown planning that builds on um, previous experiences, and then um, doing some work down in the Campello uh, district. And I'm here now to ask um, for an appropriation of uh, funds that uh, we are receiving from the state as part of our 40R program. So these are basically dividends, um, with air quotes, of, of uh, an investment that we made in smart growth in the downtown district. So when Enterprise broke ground and uh, pulled their building permit, it triggered a payment from the state uh, under the 40R program. Uh, that payment is in the amount of $339,000, um, and uh, I would like to get that allocated into um, our uh, consulting budget so that we can go on and do a citywide comprehensive plan. Uh, and for those of you who might remember, our last comprehensive plan was in 1998. Um, it's it's uh, terribly old, outdated, and not in compliance with uh, Mass State law. We also want to um, do additional work in creating a downtown revitalization plan and downtown DIF district. DIF is a way of capturing increment, uh, incremental growth uh, of property taxes and reinvesting it into those communities. Um, and then uh, also a revitalization plan for the Campello district. Um, we had uh, Urban Land Institute in here uh, a couple of years ago that started the planning process. This will be uh, funding to help us go through and finalize a master plan for that community, really get involved with the residents and local businesses and how that business district and that neighborhood is really going to look. Um, we also are requesting an additional $9,000 of that to be used um, for miscellaneous consulting. We, we uh, recently did a historic uh, survey on the Lincoln School and there's other amendments or other studies that, that we may need to do. And then um, there's a $30,000 um, investment that we would like to make with the Brockton uh, Redevelopment Authority. They just recently have taken over the home program that was used to be with the housing program, or the housing authority, excuse me. Um, but they've had to hire extra staff and they're also um, getting more involved in a first time uh, home buyers program and revitalization projects throughout the city and this would help them uh, bridge a gap in this year's um, fiscal plan for, um, for expanding those programs. Um, following these works, um, we hope to be working in other communities, especially uh, the Belmont Corridor, uh, Cowesett Co Brook, if I'm pronouncing that right, um, which is the area around the VA hospital and uh, West Chestnut um, in, in that area. Uh, also want to be working in uh, Montello and Lithuanian Village and several other spots, but this is the first yeah. chunk of uh, that work program that we want to uh, take on. Okay, great. Then yeah. I'm going to 
Minnesota Town and Community. So I respectfully request that this money be allocated. Question, Council of Bonds. Uh, Mr. May, just one question. Actually, this morning I uh, didn't meet, but I ran into a business owner down in the Campello area, and he had mentioned to me, uh, I hadn't heard you know, what was going on yet, but he had mentioned something about the parking lot next to his business. Um, he, he's in the area of the Italian kitchen, in that okay. um, uh, West Chestnut Street, East Chestnut um, area right there. And he, he, was, he was upset about something going on or some sort of something happening. And I, I don't think it's the, the con, not construction, but not the, the, um, the, the stuff that's going on there in the street. It was something else. He was talking about some kind of reconfiguration or something. But I just want to make sure that as you do these, uh, just a suggestion, as you do this, um, the plan, just to, in making sure that all of those business, businesses, at oh, least yes. in that congested area, um, are consulted. And one more thing, with the historic inventory, if there's cost to doing that, is there a way we can maybe, re oh, well, not we, but can the city recoup that in the, the sale, selling of the building or anything? Is that included? Or? Um, oh, oh, for the Lincoln School? Yeah. Um, sorry, there's two things. It's late. I'm sorry. It, it, it might be uh, a, a way to recoup some of that, which is basically a, a um, uh, an, an incre which would basically be an increase in the selling price. I don't know what the market value of that property is. Okay. And so that's something that we would have to take a look at. Okay. And uh, with regard to the Campello district, as with the citywide comp plan, community uh, comprehensive plan, it's going to be a very intensive um, uh, participatory process with businesses, property owners, residents, Everybody having an equal seat at the table. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, sir. you, Council. Council, is any other Council Sullivan? I, I just had thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. May. Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, this this body adopted 40R back in I think it was 07, might have been 06. I believe you were the sponsor of that. Time fly. I was, but time flies. You start to forget. Do you know? And this is a win-win actually. And we have the five zones downtown. D do you know how much we? I thought we got about 300 grand back then. Do you, do you have any clue what the original allotment from the state was? Um, I don't remember what the original amount was. There, there's several different payments that come out of the 40R, or come out of the Smart Growth Program. The first is when the city designates this particular area, um, we did get a, a, a payment. It went a, a long way to doing um, some work, a lot of work downtown. Uh, in, in the uh, McCabe report and the um, Concord Square market analysis. That was maybe five years ago. Uh, this, the work that we're talking about builds on top of that. The second payments come uh, when a building permit is issued um, and that is what this money is from. This is, this is the dividend from the enterprise block. There's a third payment under smart growth which is uh, actually called 40S. And that is if the tax revenue, both property and excise taxes that are generated by the, the, that project aren't enough to offset the cost of educating any children that are coming out of that, that project, the state makes an additional payment to the city. So it's a, it's a safety belt, it's an a, a insurance policy really that's, that the state is, is invested in smart growth and that um, any new growth doesn't have adverse effects on our school district. Okay. Mr. Condon, do, do you remember when Nancy Savoy was the planner, do, do you remember her coming before this body? Did, didn't we get, the first payment we got is when we accepted it, but didn't we get a second one because it was a push to have a development project? Didn't we get the additional funds at that time? That's a good question, Councilor. I, I don't remember that. I do remember the first payment coming yeah. in because you accepted it. I'm pretty sure that happened. Um, if we could maybe just check the records on that. My question is, if there's future development and future adoptions of 40R, do you, do you keep getting the money? Uh, is, uh, uh, to the chair, as, as more projects come online, yeah. as more building permits are issued, yes, there will, that, be, that there will be additional payments. Okay, yes. all right. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. May, thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> thank you, sir. Um, as we move forward in this city, and uh, we know that more and more uh, linguistic minorities are getting involved in the, uh, in the business uh, aspect of things, are there any plans from your office to do some sort of uh, workshops in terms of uh, workshops in other languages to uh, encourage some of these, uh, some of these other folks uh, 
to get involved in this process? Um, yes, sir. As a matter of fact, in the uh, request for proposals for consulting services that I'm working on right now, um, should the council uh, approve this allocation, we want to um, make sure that there is a concerted effort to provide language translation both at the, at the community meetings, but also of key documents that are produced, and we'll be producing those on the web, and we may even create a, a special YouTube channel that will allow for um, uh, translation of, of public meetings that are going on. But I'm actually talking about actually holding some workshops along with our schools or in our schools to, to basically invite some of the, uh, oh, yes, the ethnic communities to come in and basically understand how this whole process work. Because we, you know, we don't want to have a city that you know, half knows what's going on, going on and the other half not knowing what's going on. So <clears throat> I would encourage you to do that if I. Yeah, yes, sir. In, in addition to meetings in specific uh. wards or specific villages that we have across the city, there will be um, special outreach um, and, and special meetings for um, uh, language, uh, different languaged groups. Uh, throughout the city. It's very important that uh, they participate in this because it is their city too and they're going to have a role in, in shaping the future. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if there's any more questions. If, if there's, there isn't any, I'd like to make a motion to recommend favorable. Second. 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 Motion's been made and seconded to, to recommend back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council with a favorable all. recommendation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. May. Um, item Mr. Chairman, Council Student, I'd like to make a motion this time to take number seven, eight, nine, and ten uh, collectively. Second. 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 Motion has been made and seconded. We take items seven, eight, nine, and ten collectively. All in favor of that? Opposed? We will take them collectively. Just keep in mind, Council, that it's different jobs for each different school, but um, no reason why we can't talk about that all in one, uh, all in one lump. So, um, Madam Clerk, if you want to read the uh, items. Order that the city appropriate the amount of $3,861,770 for the purpose of paying costs of roof repairs and resurfacing, refa yeah, resurfacing including the payments of all costs incidental and related thereto at the Brookfield Ele Elementary School. Order that the city appropriate the amount of $2,075,919 for the purpose of the complete replacement of the school's windows at the Barrett Russell Kindergarten. Order that the city appropriate the amount of $3,590,486 for the purpose of paying costs of roof repairs and resurfacing boiler replacement at the Ashfield Middle School. Order that the city appropriate the amount of $2,843,301 for the purpose of paying costs of roof repairs and resurfacing boiler replacements at the Gilmore Early Childhood Center. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Cohen, <coughs> Chief Financial Officer, Aldo Petronio, Chief fin Budget Officer, Michael Thomas, Deputy Superintendent Operations, Kenneth Thompson, Director of Facilities, James Caseri, Superintendent Public Properties, to all of them. I believe we'll start with Mr. Condon because I think he has the checkbook somewhat, so or explain to us anyways. Thank okay. you, Mr. Condon. Uh, good evening, Councilors. Uh, these are four repair projects which are approved in three instances already by the Mass Building uh, Association, MSBAB, uh, for almost 80% reimbursement of eligible cost. And the fourth one on the Barrett Russell, they're anticipating approval. In fact, we've got a, a conference call coming up uh, on Friday of this week on that project. There already have been discussions, and that's, that's the window project. So uh, basically the way it works is uh, you've, you've done another one of these projects earlier is the uh, state pays its share as you go. The city would borrow its cost, uh, probably do it on a temporary loan at the beginning of the summer, and we wouldn't permanently finance it until we'd had the audit. And so the cost in the initial stages here are gonna be probably zero for next year because the interest payment wouldn't come due until fiscal 16 in the summer of fiscal 16. <coughs> And then when we finally financed it, the cost would be quite uh, reasonable because we're only going to be paying about $250,000 a year while the bonds are outstanding. All of the projects are needed work. If they're approved, we get the money. If they're not approved, we go off the list and some other community is going to grab that money. So you're getting 13, roughly $13 million worth of uh, projects for three point something million dollars of our cost. I think uh, Aldo and Ken Thompson and, uh, and Mike Thomas are here to talk about the specifics of the projects and uh, my recommendation is to move ahead. Okay, thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, 
We, you know, I know the superintendent of school is here as well. I don't know if she wanted to say anything uh, beforehand. If you want to say anything, uh, Madam Superintendent, and just so you know, we do have you on the next finance agenda, second one in March for you wanted to make your presentation. Very so excited so to that. be here for okay. the state of the schools address. Great, so I'm substituting for Mike Thomas today, yep. my deputy superintendent. Um, again, uh, excellent work uh, putting this forward with not only our school department, but also working very closely with City Hall. And I think with the historic winter and what we have just seen and you've seen surrounding communities, when you look back at the previous green repair project, and that was the roof and windows at Brockton High, uh, the windows at the Downey School, North uh, Middle School, the roof and boilers, Hancock, the roof, East Middle School, a roof, and West Middle School, a roof. You know, some of the reasons that we're not dealing with what other communities are dealing with because we put these projects forward. I've talked to you and I will continue to talk about uh, for the school department a facility master plan. This is certainly a great start and a support from our mass school building assistance to be able to uh, continue these projects. So I thank you for entertaining this this evening and uh, Chief Budget Officer Aldo Petronio and Ken Thompson are here to answer any of the questions you may great, have. Great, thank you Madam Superintendent. I do want to acknowledge the uh, Vice Chairman of the School Committee is here, uh, wow. Attorney Minicello, and I also noticed that the uh, School Committee member Ozzie Jordan is also present. Uh, in the audience, so thank you both for coming. Uh, first, Council, Council Duval, you had a question? Yes, I do, thank you so much. So Mr. Condon, um, I added up the four items and I think I came up with it being a little bit more than $12 million, does that sound right to you? Yes, yeah, a, a little bit more than 12, yes. Yep. And so um, are we getting, what percent match are we getting from the state? Is it like well, 80%, it's, it's, 90%? Uh, it's almost 79% of the eligible cost. So the way these projects work, uh, typically there are some cost elements in there that the state ultimately says, no, we won't pay for that. So I'm thinking probably 75% of that number will be paid for the, by the state and the balance will be the city's cost. Three million that you're suggesting that we roughly bond, three, right? Roughly three million, yeah. And so what would the payments be on the 3.6 Well, when we dollars? finally borrow permanently, it would be about $250,000 a year for 20 years, declining because it would be, that's the most expensive year if you pay level principal and interest and the <laughs> assumption on the interest there is 4%. I think we need to assume 4% because by the time we borrow, it might be two years from now and you know, the interest rate environment might be different, but a little bit less than a quarter of a million dollars a year. And so when I read um, the agenda at the city council and there was like a, I don't know what the, the proper word is, but like a little addendum that said your certification of this bonding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is contingent on the city council putting forward a prop two and a half override. Did no, I not, okay, so explain that to me. No ma'am, what the certification letter said was that the certification is conditioned upon the city council and the, and the mayor being willing to recommend and appropriate from the existing taxing authority that the city has because you've got many millions of, of dollars in the levy which is unused at the moment. If this, so ba basically all I'm really saying is I'm assuming that to pay the bills and pay the other bills, you'd be willing to use unle unused levy capacity if necessary. So this year, um, we didn't, how much of the levy capacity did we use? Uh, we used, uh, we left two and a half million dollars roughly of uh, levy capacity unused. So we left two and a half million dollars of levy cap capacity on years. So next year you're saying that we should utilize that 2.5 million. What was the whole levy capacity this year? Uh, it was 117, 120 million, something like that. So you, you basically left unused uh, two and a half million of the three million, two and a half. Thank you. And so next year, are you assuming that the levy will be somewhere around three million, or will be six million? Yes. Because we can use this year's amount that hasn't been levied and no. levy it next year. Is that it? Yes. Next year, the two and a half million dollars that wasn't levied in fiscal 15 is available, and you'll have about a three million dollar increase from fiscal 16. But these projects, I don't think, are going to have any cost impact, budget impact in fiscal 16, because as I said, we would probably borrow the money sometime in the beginning of the fiscal year with an interest only payment due in fiscal 17 and that might continue for several years until the projects have been completed and finally audited by the state in which at that time we'd issue the, the debt. Okay and then um, 
in this letter, and, and Councillor Rodriguez, um, at large counselor, gave me a copy of it, so I'm happy to have it in front of me now. I'm sorry I didn't before. Have you had a conversation with the mayor, and has he agreed that he will appropriate sufficient funding from the present unused levy capacity under the levy limit of Prop 2.5 to pay for the annual debt service of the project? I, I, I assume he will because he's put these projects forward. What he doesn't know and what I don't know is by the time we actually need to make that kind of an appropriation, what the levy capacity will be. All I'm saying is at the moment, I don't know where we'll be in two or three years, but at the moment there's a lot of unused levy capacity. This is just a small fraction of it. You could tap that levy capacity without having a significant increase in taxes, and you don't need a two and a half override at this time. Great. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Could I ask um, Superintendent Smith a question? <coughs> Hi, Superintendent Smith. Thank you so much for being here. So um, a lot of this work are boilers, roofs, and things like that. How long do you think, um, if we were to approve this and you got the items fixed, what's the life expectancy of these buildings with these improvements? I mean, are we going to see we invest this money in the Ashfield and then it gets closed down like the Franklin did? Or what is the... I mean, not that we invested that much money in the Franklin. I'm not trying to say that we did. I'm just trying to wonder, if we make these investments, is it going to make these schools solid? And if so, for how many years? I, I can't answer that for how many years. Uh, and, and when I started out, I mentioned we certainly are looking to go forward with a facility master plan right. that does just that. It looks at buildings. It talks about you know renovations. Um, Honestly, we're probably looking at some point because of the growth you've heard me talk about many times of probably building at, at least a new school. Right. So that would be part of looking at our facility plan. I think what's interesting when you look at, for instance, the Ashfield School, it, you know, built in 1965, it has right now its original boiler. This, the roof wow. was built in 1985 at the Ashfield. Wow. So I, I'm learning quite a bit about roofs right now. I think all of us are. <laughs> um, but again, I, I couldn't quite say how long. You look at the Barrett Russell. We renovated that as a school two years ago, brought it back online. The windows, I believe, were replaced in 1975. Right. So you're talking almost 40 years ago. So as a city, we are looking to maintain the buildings that we have. These buildings presently are structurally sound. Um, this obviously would make quite a difference going forward. And we will continue to look at all of our facilities. As I said, we're probably looking to really for expansion as far as taking, if we were to take any buildings offline, it would be looked at for probably renovation at this point. We don't have that luxury, right. we, don't have, we don't have the space. Well, I, having been up at the State House a couple months, I would get to talk to different people about the different things that I didn't talk to people about here. And one was like the average age of a school building. And I was quoted that the typical, they start looking to replace them when the building's around 50, 60 years old. So I'm just looking at the Brookfield and the Ashfield, and they're already at that age. And I know that we don't have that luxury of being able to just replace all of our elementary schools, though we'd like to. But do you, in your professional opinion or someone here, can you see a school going 80 years? I mean, can you do that? I mean, I assume you can. Part of the process, Counselor, with the MSBA is that they review our applications in detail, and we, we apply for more schools and get approved. And part of the reason is because they're looking at this saying, if we're going to invest 75, 80 percent of the money, we want to know that on a 20-year project, you're going to get 20 years life out of that school. Right. Mm. They don't want to put state money forward and then have us, for, you know, five years down the line, tear it down. Mm. In the same respect, when we complete a master plan of the city and go forward to them to build a new school, they will step in and say, you do or you don't need that new school. We've right. invested money in your community. You have schools that are sufficient. Um, our biggest catalyst is the fact that we're growing at four or 500 students a year. It's crazy. So um, the MSBA wouldn't put forward this, these funds if they thought we were going to get a few years out of these schools. So I can safely assume that the Brookfield and the Ashfield are going to be around for a while. Yes. Great. Well, I think this is wonderful. I'm going to support it, and I thank you both for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Um, actually, I think Jimmy Kassiri, maybe, if you could, just looking at a couple of these jobs. And Ken wasn't around, I don't think, when this happened. Uh, roof repairs at the Gilmore. Didn't we have a major issue down there about five, six years ago that we had to fix the roof? Yeah, it was a structural issue. It was with the um, arch beams inside of the um, 
the cafeteria building. Yeah. So this is and the yeah. sister school as well was the Kennedy, and they both had similar right, problems right. at the same time. Okay, so this is not with the structural. This is with the, the this roof is the outside membrane of the roof and the insulation <laughs> and the, and this is waterproofing. And as, as Superintendent Smith said, I can't imagine if we hadn't done the work we did recently to the roofs and we were going through a winter like this right now, we'd be going crazy at the Raymond and Davis in particular. So. And Davis was like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, resurfacing boiler replacement. Resurfacing means the roof membrane. Okay, so there should be a comma between yeah, resurfacing and boiler it's, replacement. Yeah, right. It's I, not you know I'm in that business. Yeah. I said, well, I've been doing this for 40 years, right. and I've never seen resurfacing. I thought boiler it was resurfacing roads until recently. So okay, all right. So that's just uh, should be a comma there. Okay, um, and then just uh, when did the BB Russell become the Barrett Russell? Oh, That's just, it's, uh, it's been, been the B.B. Russell since I was a kid. <laughs> did we get, get hoity-toity and name it the Barrett Russell when I wasn't looking? First of all, uh, for a history lesson, I think this is fabulous. And, I, and if you come to our conference room, you see the picture of Barrett Russell. So. Barrett Russell was your first superintendent of schools in Brockton. Right. More importantly, when we went to... They just to, keep getting better all the time. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> keep sucking up. <laughs> so, I interesting enough, um, we do have a program. Many of you know we have the B.B. Russell program. It is an alternative school. It's an you know, alternative pathway for a number of our students uh, that go on to receive high school diplomas, continue on to college. Um, we're very proud of our alternative options for students. That being said, because it was an alternative program, when we were opening a new kindergarten, and the building is the, the B.B. Russell, as you mentioned, it really has differentiated the two. You know, it has become known as the Barrett Russell Kindergarten Center, a wonderful place where we have close to 300 little kindergartners every day learning. So again, it kind of put a new spin on the building. It still honors B.B. Russell or Barrett Russell, and we continue right now to still have our pathway program, the B.B. Russell School, which is at the uh, Keith School, which Thank was you. the Arnone, which was the high school. I was only so, teasing. Just, just to confuse you a little more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Councilor Moises Rodriguez. Well, Superintendent, I hate to be the uh, bearer of bad news, but oh. I know everybody is talking, laughing, having a good, good old time here, but I've got to bring up some is an, an issue that's kind of bugging the daylights out of me. Uh, being a product of, uh, of the Brockton school system, I'm, uh, I don't think there's a single person that's prouder of, Brock of the Brockton schools than I am, uh, since this, that was the first encounter with schools in this country when I first got here. So. And I'm in support of this measure. Uh, I just want to make sure that I'm on the record saying that I support the measure. But I'm going to bring up something that's a, a bit of a concern to me, and it has been a concern to a lot of parents in this community. And that's the condition of the module classrooms at the Brookfield. Um, I have received numerous calls for parents. Uh, these are parents that actually uh, at times can't speak for themselves because of the language issue. Uh, concerning about the condition of, the, uh, of those modular classrooms. And I remember us, when we were touring that school during the summer, the floors were buck, you know, bucking somewhat, the ceilings were dipping. And from what I understand from, um, from talking to this parent, is that now they're actually saying that there might be some mold in the ceiling because there were some, uh, some leaks and some waters dripping from the, the rain, uh, not the rain, but the snow or whatever. But there's actually some molding up there. <clears throat> I don't want to. I don't want to state anything to be taken out of context in the sense, but we do know that those uh, those module classrooms are used by ESOL students or students in the bilingual program. Um, it kind of is a little bothersome in the sense where a plan was a plan was put into place to fix some issues at the school, but yet we know that there are problems with those classrooms in that school. I can't imagine what the cost would be to get rid of those things and replace them with, with, with you know, mortar and brick uh, in terms of additional classrooms to, to put an addition to the school. But I find it somewhat bothersome in the sense that that whole issue was not taken into account when we're submitting uh, a plan to repair the schools. Okay, I think, and, the, okay, I'm sorry, Councillor. Yeah, and what happens is that it, it kind of takes, um, it takes a little from what we're trying to do here in terms of, um, you know, you've got some parents that feel that 
you know, some kids on the on this side of town are being taken care of well, for doing you know us doing whatever we need to do. But yet, some of these kids, especially these little brown kids, are sitting in these classrooms that we all agreed over the summer that they were not appropriate classrooms for kids to be in. So I want to know what can we do to include the repairs to those modular classrooms. And what can we actually do to making sure that the problems that exist in those module classrooms do not help in our school system? Okay, a, a couple of questions here. One is, um, and you and I certainly were together when we, this fall, we went and saw the facilities in many of our schools. And one of the stops was the Brookfield School. And there were concerns there. What we did this past year is we were actually looking to replace the modular classrooms starting at the Kennedy School. They were the oldest, they were the most in disrepair. Because of a very, very difficult budget, we backed off of that as far as expanding the modulars and purchasing new ones, and we ended up repairing them over the summer. And if you've had an opportunity to see the Kennedy modulars, um, it's a place you would want your students to actu actually attend at the Kennedy. There's air conditioning, there's new walls, there's new structure. It was wonderful to open school this past September. The Davis, the Brookfield are also on our list. It certainly was a cost factor. Um, there are things that we're looking at right now. I keep coming before you saying facility master plan. More importantly, we're also right now in the middle of looking at our facilities for, you mentioned the Brookfield, and we're busing students, uh, many of our ESL students, clear across the city to go to the Brookfield for this program. So we, we are looking at that as far as where we're housing children. We are trying to make decisions on the cost effectiveness of taking, the, the modulars were supposed to, supposed to have a, a life expectancy of about 20 years, at 15, and we're close to 20 years on a number of these modulars, so it is a concern for us. I'm hoping right now, because of the space issue, that we'll address that in our facility master plan, and also with lessons learned. We looked at the Kennedy last year, we di did a good job fixing those structures. Uh, I believe the Davis is the next one we're looking at, and certainly the Brookfield will be part of that discussion. But if they are actually mold in the ceiling, from what I understand, yeah. at that, least this is what I'm getting from a parent. Yeah. I will certainly have Deputy Superintendent look at that immediately. Ken Thompson is sitting here with me tonight, so we will take this back. We did, in fact, have a couple of, of leaks. Uh, that was addressed as far as taking care of the roofs this past couple of weeks. Uh, I, I'm not aware that there's mold there, but we certainly will look at that. It, but is there any way we can, I don't know exactly what it would cost in additional funding in the sense for us to include some sort of a repair since, I mean, the roof is leaking, it's only a matter of time. If the roof is leaking, chances are there's water coming into the building and this could possibly be mold in the, in the, uh, in the, in those the modules. The MSBA does not consider a modular part of the original building, so they won't cover the roof repair on that. <coughs> when these are all submitted, they go through and they'll let you know what they're repairing, what they're not. Something like that is a capital request, a capital repair request, and that's something that we can submit um, at budget time for the council to decide if we're going to lease new modulars or the real plan here is to build a new school if we can get approved and not be putting money into these modular classrooms. We'd rather see a new, a new school. I have, I've been here for a little over a year, and I don't think I've ever made a request in terms of spending city funds on anything. I'm just saying that I am making a request to you folks to, to put forward some sort of a plan, some sort of a, a request to the mayor, to, to the city itself, so that we can come up with the funding or the necessary fundings to fix the problems at, at least at this school. Um, again, last year we were fully prepared in our budget to go forward. We have all kinds of costs on the Kennedy modulars, and with the budget it became cost prohibitive. How much did it cost, the Kennedy, I, do you remember? I want to say it was for the Kennedy last year when we were looking to increase the classes and fix the modulus. It was close to $600,000? There's a million and a half over three years. Oh, to, for, right, for totally. So a million and a half over three years. So it wouldn't be uh, cost prohibited just to, just to basically find out what it would cost to repair those... Uh, uh, at least the modules that we have at that school now, just, just so that we have something to say to some of these parents. We're, we're very happy to put that together. And uh, speaking to Ken Thompson, tomorrow we can go in and we can take a look at the mold issue uh, at the Brookfield School, if in fact that exists. Thank you, Madam. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Council, is any uh, move to approve? Second. second. Motion been made and second to approve. All in favor? Opposed? Those four items go back to the full city council for uh, favor with a favor of recommendation. Item number 11, Madam Clerk. Order that the City of Brockton Government Study Committee is hereby established to be comp comprised of seven citizens of the city, three of whom are to be appointed by the mayor and four of whom are to be appointed by the city council president. Mr. Chairperson. Council yeah, Stewart. I'd like to motion to have this uh, postponed uh, in, indefinitely. I'm looking for co-sponsorship um, on this item and, and, and I'm in talks with the colleague here on the council to, to do so. Second. Motion's been made and seconded that we just postpone this item and then Councilor Stewart will um, uh, breast to us whenever he wants to bring it back up again. All in favor of that? Opposed? <laughs> we'll leave that postponed. We go to one. Number item 12 is the Stonehill College and I, I don't believe, um, I, I do believe that Francis Dillon sent us a letter indicating that they Mr. could not Chairman. make it this evening. So Councilor Azak. I'd like to make a motion to defer this to the second finance meeting in April. Second. 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 Motion been made and seconded that this item will be deferred to our second finance meeting in April. All in favor? Opposed? That goes through, that passed. And then we have item number 13. Mr. President, I'd like Council. to move to postpone this till the second meeting in April. Second. Second. Uh, motion be made in a second that this item be postponed to the second finance meeting in April. All in favor? Which one is? Oh, that's Opposed? That, that as well. That'll be the second finance in April. And then the last one we have, um, I believe, is in regards to um, a query with the uh, financial implications. And I, I know this was something the Council of Denapoli put forth, but at the same time, the two people that we invited um, from Aquaria uh, were not here this evening, so I would uh, entertain that we just uh, take a motion on that Should one. postpone. No, no. Second. All in favor? Motion. Second. All in favor to postpone uh, those Second. items. Councilor Sullivan, you had... Uh, I do. Uh, Mr. 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 Chairman, uh, those members of the Ordinance Committee, uh, of course, I chair it this year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, on that. But Ordinance is going to meet next Monday night at 7.30 which is uh, March 9th. We have an 8 o'clock full city council meeting. We'll be meeting here at 7.30 for ordinance. Also, councilors, I just want to share a quick story with you today. I went to see, I was here at City Hall. I went to the assessor's office to pick up something. And uh, Paul Sullivan had indicated to me just a few minutes before that, an individual came off the street, came into the, um, the city hall, went into the assessor's office, started causing a lot of flack and commotion to the workers there and jumped up and ripped the fan from the ceiling. So when I got there, Brockton PD was there. So I spoke to Mr. Sullivan, and, and I had mentioned this a few years ago, and I'm, I'm hoping the council, um, collectively, we can work on this, and Mr. Conan and the mayor can come up with the money, but we need to some, come up with some type of public safety mechanisms. I know there's cameras here, but we need um, metal detectors. We need something. If you go to any town hall or city hall, um, there's mechanisms there to protect not just the people that come off the streets, but the workers. I mean, God forbid if Mr. Sullivan wasn't there and that gentleman didn't run out of the chamber, run out of that office, I don't know what could have happened. So we need to work collectively. Unfortunately, in this time of uh, public safety, it's something that we can't shirk and it's a duty we should work on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councilor Sullivan. Mr. President, I'd like a moment of Council personal privilege. Councilor Dubois. Thank you. I would just like to take this opportunity to say that um, I really hope that this city council takes a long look at the mayor's actions of late around the sale of effluent based on a 19-year-old contract that is speculative at best. And I'd also like to draw my city council um, colleagues' attention to rereading the decisions of the Energy Facility Siting Board and the decisions of the Supreme Judicial P Court. Both bodies referenced the Brockton's Effluent Sale Water Ordinance as in good standing, and both decisions um, said that the Brockton City Council would have to vote on the sale of effluent. So the mayor signing this really silly agreement with a $100,000 sale of our effluent water that at minimum is worth the same bracketed amount as the potable water they wanted to buy for a song is not only I think illegal, which we're looking into, and I think that we should really make sure that our powers aren't circumvented. And it, when I say our powers, I don't mean you and I sitting here. 
because in five, ten years, next year, I'm not going to be here. I'm talking about the city council and our authority and our fiscal fiduciary responsibility that we swear to every two years to uphold the law and the charter. And I really think a mockery is being um, put out right now to the point that if we decided as a body, we didn't like the DPW and we love the fire department, and we decided as a body that we were going to put in an order taking away $500,000 from the DPW and assigning it to the fire department. That would be us overreaching our, our responsibilities and our powers under this form of government. And that is akin to what the mayor is doing by signing this long-term contract without putting an order before the city council. I hope that one of us files an order to direct the city council attorney explore all legal options to maintain the city council's authority under this plan of government. I really am discouraged and dismayed at the mayor's um, first off lack of negotiation acumen to sell our effluent for $100,000 a year, but second, the total disrespect for our form of government. It's not about winners or losers. It's not about the issue of the power plant and if you're for it or against it. It's about the basics of following the form of government that we all, every two years, get sworn in to uphold. And we just can't let anyone make, the, make a mockery of it, because our decisions to capitulate now are going to have ramifications on city councils moving forward over the next God knows how long. So I just implore you all to read those decisions and to really think hard about what's happening with this effluent um, sale. I'm really problemed by it, and I really think we need to get it corrected. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Councilor Sullivan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. first of all, I want to uh, applaud my colleague, Ms. Dubois, and, and you know, rest assured the council is looking at all alternatives and all options on that. But I misspoke. I'm sorry. Members of the Ordinance Committee, we're not meeting on Monday. I'm sorry. We're meeting on Tuesday at 6.30 here. Um, Monday night is full city council. We're meeting on Tuesday at 6.30. There's a 7 o'clock ZBA meeting here in the chamber. I don't anticipate the meeting too long. So please, those that sit on the Ordinance Committee, Tuesday, the 10th of March, 6.30 here. Thank you. Thank you. And, Councilors, you should have received some new information in regards to the Sun Edison. I think it was information we were waiting for, and um, I know that's back on our agenda for uh, next Monday evening. Uh, we'll be City Council here at 8 p.m. Any other business to come before this uh, committee this evening? Seeing none, meeting adjourned. <laughs>